up, everybody? People coming Hello, in live here. Getting ready to do a little show. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to double check and see how we're doing in the old, the old, ye old chat room. <laughs> All right. We've got Dan Marino, Emmett Smith, <laughs> <laughs> and Matt and Chris and John, Maria, <clears throat> Matt Daffy. All my be real friends. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like we're good here. I'm just going to make sure we're good on the Facebooks. Do a little show. Let's see. How are we looking here? Right. I think we are What's up, good. Tom? What's up, Tessa? Boy, everyone's coming in. Tom. Everyone shows up for Jules. Tom Glintz, long time no talk. <laughs> yeah. No one shows up for us. Everyone shows up for Jules. <laughs> Let's see. Looks like we're about good. Facebook's good. All right. I think we're good to go. How's everybody feeling? Ready to do a show? Let's do it. All right. Always ready with you guys. Awesome. <clears throat> All right. I need my notes. That'd probably help. Mm-hmm. Where are they? There we are. All right. Is my phone muted? Yes. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right. Here we go. <laughs> What's up and welcome to another MoGraph MoCast. I'm Dave. And I'm Matt, and joining us today is one of our favorite people in the entire industry, Mr. Jules Urbach. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me back, guys. Really, yeah. I love being here. And MoGraph is a supplement to our site, MoGraph.com, which is a motion graphics tutorial site with tutorials, plugins, podcasts, and other MoGraph stuff. And on the show, we talk about everything ranging from motion graphics to Cinema 4D, After Effects, plugins, render engines, doing business, doing taxes, being a contractor... We're working for the man. You can email us info at mograph.com. Let us know what you think about the show, questions, comments, concerns, queries, grievances, artist suggestions, show topic ideas. We're on mograph.com or on youtube.com slash mograph. Or you can just at mograph now on YouTube like you mm -hmm. do. And yes, yeah, so send us your questions. Send us ideas for the show. All the things we will be uh, happy to attempt, at least attempt to answer them. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't have a lot of week wrap up on the show today. We have... Uh, a lot going on uh it's it's the holidays as you know mm -hmm. i think um matt i sent you this tiktok from speed racer where it was talking about ad agencies yeah. during the holidays yeah. it's like there's no <laughs> use in crying just yeah. just do it yep. uh so there's a lot of stuff going on um so we're gonna get right to it today and talk about all the th all things octane all things otoy with jewels <clears throat> uh, i've got copious notes as usual um, I, I would say the biggest thing right now is the big Black Friday sale. Yeah. <laughs> How is that going? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it, 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 I think it went great. You know, last year was our biggest Black Friday ever. This year, I think we kind of like, I mean, just in terms of the numbers of new subs, we mm -hmm. doubled it, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. I, I just got those wow. numbers recently. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's been, I think that the, the thinking behind the kind of bundle that we're doing, which is more than just discounting the price, right? It's adding a lot of other partner software besides ours mm -hmm. into the mm -hmm. mix was, you know, some of the software that we, I and mean, obviously Grace with Real is a big one, Kitbash is a big one. Those are things that Octane mm -hmm. users probably already know and love. So I think that value is, uh, is clear. And, you know, the thinking with these partners is that we want to sort of expose our ecosystems to each other. So I think there was a, a, a promotion where Grace with Gorilla was offering Octane to Grayscale Gorilla, you know, GSG Plus um, subs. And I think that <clears throat> I think that with some of these other pieces, like when we started with Embergen, um, it was to get exposure. And I think with Cascadeur, which is an AI animation system, I'm which is very fantastic, excited about that. You know, yeah. Yeah. You, you know, they, they were like, well, wow, you know, if this is something that all Otoy subs can experience, that's great for us. And of course, you know, we, we come up with an arrangement where we, it, it's good for everyone to, you know, to be able to do the bundle. Um, and we also added, um, like 3D, which is a fantastic hard surface modeler. A lot of mm -hmm. great octane art has been done with that. It's, it's, you know, you can use that by the way with Blender and C40 and other tools, but it's a hardcore, um, really good modeler. And I think that, you know, having all those things in one bundle that is, <clears throat> you know, 16 bucks a month, 
uh, with everything else is, is great. And uh, we never know going into Black Friday what, who, who we're going to be able to pull in, how people will react to it. But last year's was great. So we we're like, well, let's try to do everything we did last year and add a few more things. And, uh, and we did. And at the same day, of course, we shipped uh, actually 2022 Stable, yes. which has uh, been a long, a long time in development, but has some huge, you know, really huge features like that photon tracing kernel, uh -huh. uh, which we teased, I don't know, two years ago with those instant caustics. That's great. Um, another big thing which we should talk about is the support for Arnold standard surface, which is now also yeah. yes. supported as this, you know, Redshift standard material. Mm -hmm. Unreal is adding it in Unreal 5.1. So, you know, we were the second to add it. Obviously, I just created this, you know, this standard. Um, and we did the work with them to sort of be, you know, sort of add to that. And it's great to see that becoming standardized. So I think that for, you know, Chad Ashley over at, at Grace Gorilla, he's going to yeah. be happy because, again, you probably have like one sort of at least one core material type that will also, it looks like that will also be the core material that USD adopts around Material X. Mm -hmm. And that's good. I mean, we're, we're huge fans of open source, open standards, and uh, interoperability. Um, and then there's there's a lot of other great features in 2022 that, um, that I think users will love. And we previewed as well just some early um, some early tests of 2023. The beta for that starts uh, in a couple of weeks. We'll do a closed beta awesome. like mm -hmm. we did with Octane 2021. So I think we had about 200 uh, beta testers in that Slack channel, those will be eligible for testing 2023. And uh, yeah, we included some some dope screenshots and videos of, of what's coming in that um, as well. So yeah, Black Friday was, was a big day for us. Uh, one of the things that uh, I found interesting with the new sale is, um, it, it, is, is, am I correct in assuming that it's now just Studio Plus and that's it? There's no Enterprise Plus yeah. and Studio and it's all just one tier now, correct? That is correct. And I think it's to the benefit of everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Now that there's really only one choice, you either pay for you know, a subscription or you don't. That's right. literally it. And if you don't, by the way, there's the free prime versions for Blender on Mac, really. But if you're paying for it, it really, there's one price, there's one offering. And, and it's it's still, even after the Black Friday sale, for an annual sub, it's still going to be nineteen ninety nine a month. And then it, it's slightly higher, 23 95 if you're doing month to month mm -hmm. but that now includes everything that was not just in enterprise but also in enterprise plus you get all the 10 render nodes you can do i mean there's nothing there's nothing you're missing offline mode works mm -hmm. and uh, and it's essentially priced at the same cost as, as studio used to be so mm -hmm. you know that 20 dollars a month is a very important price point that um you know and of course on black friday it's discounted you know at you know 20 percent. so you can get it today for that 15.99 uh, a month price point which is pretty crazy it's so, it's yeah. it's insane i was i was talking to the guys on the discord the other day and i i i, I have to give you guys props because you know the additional 10 render nodes is a game changer you know, uh, there's there's no other company that actually does that, you know, at least for GPU rendering, where you buy a subscription for it and you actually get the render nodes with it. And uh, 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 we had talked about how Octane is the easiest one to get yes. your render nodes set up and so actually easy. working. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's yeah. such a game changer. If you haven't done it yeah. before, I can imagine like you're like, okay, what am I doing now? But really, just mm -hmm. setting up that command line deal. I had to do it again yesterday because I was upgrading, and mm -hmm. it's just so easy to get it running. Um, and once you do the install too, like I have a shortcut on my desktop, you know, to to Me start too. the daemon yeah. or whatever. <laughs> once you do the install, you can use that same shortcut. It it opens mm -hmm. the new one. Like you don't have to change that. So a lot of times, like I'll have it open in my startup, you know, on the render machines and stuff. But it's so easy, and it's so nice to be able to add that power to it. I I wish mm -hmm. that everybody did it that way. But, yeah. you know, unless you have some sort of, like, weird firewall issue or something mm -hmm. off off the wall, I mean, they just come right up. And I love yeah. that. You just, yeah. You're just yeah. adding power. So easy. Yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, uh, so I, uh, at Half Res this year, I won a uh, year uh, uh, subscription to Arnold. So I've been playing around with Arnold quite a bit, and I really enjoyed their standard surface material. And so when I downloaded 2022.1 the other day, uh, just a couple days ago, I was so excited about these standard surface materials because they're so simple to use. Like, especially the subsurface, it's just a slider. That's all it is. And it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. It's it's really simple. 
And I think that, um, you know, for the, uh, you know, for users that are coming from Arnold, of course, you know, it's great. But I do think that as an industry, we agreed for artists, um, this is a really simple model. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you can't use some of the other stuff we've had before. Um, also, you're seeing there's a little bit of stuff being added into Redshift, where, for example, the Redshift version of this has the uh, sort of a selector for the diffuse part, where you can select between, um, you, know, the, you know, I guess, uh, version or the ordinary of BRDF. We, we added that, too, just so that if you're, if you're using Redshift and material, the Austin one will kind of work along the same lines. And so I, there is a dialogue going between us and Maxon and others about how to get this thing to be just right among all the different you know, renders, but yeah. we're so close. It really does work really well. And I think the next step is seeing where Material X ends up because Material X includes a lot of nodes, a lot of things that you could standardize on. It's not everything, but it's definitely a very good you know, subset of, I think, a complete set of nodes between the major renders. Um, but it is easy to use. I mean, you know, Arnold's, uh, their mindset for artists is great. That's why we jumped on board pretty early in adopting it and uh, making sure it works perfectly in Octane 2022. And in 23, we'll do even more work to make sure that, uh, yeah, especially some of the features in 23, where you know we will ship with multi-render. Right? That is one of the things that is working. And one of the easiest ones to bundle is Arnold, CPU and GPU. It, it, it just, mm -hmm. the beta of 2023 includes it in there. And the idea is that you can switch live in your IPR between Arnold and Octane. And I showed this years ago yeah. in a form that was not ready for, for users. But you know, yeah, mm -hmm. I guess standard surface is our way of getting that to work really nicely. And it is really easy for artists. So I think it's to the benefit of everyone, and certainly to the art itself, that you can have this, this sort of standard in there um, and that we can all collectively work to improve it in ways that doesn't break the simplicity. Yeah, I and was I, really hoping. I was really hoping I had that this past week. I've been working on like a fun little uh, project for myself, and I I wanted to do it all in Arnold to test it out. You know, because I wanted I wanted to kind of learn it. So I had a lot of subsurface scattering in one of my scenes, and in order to clean it up on GPU, you know, with CPU you can actually go through and do all the individual settings and stuff, but with GPU you just throw samples at it, you know. And so one frame in order to get it clean was taking me 45 minutes per frame, oh, and I had 415 frames. And so, uh, in, in, wow. it, uh, yeah. So I, I was <laughs> like. You know what? I'm just gonna. I, I spent two hours and I just retextured and relit the entire thing in Octane, and it ended up being like two minutes a frame after I was <laughs> done. But I was really hoping that I would have been able. I had that uh, uh, multi-renderer kernel <laughs> to be able to use yeah. uh, uh, the same things. And I did notice that yeah. you know the standard service material. You know all the settings are very similar to the Arnold one. It seems to me like there could be like an OSL script or some sort of something in order to easily convert one to the other. Mm. Yeah. I mean, my goal would be, and you're seeing, we're seeing a trend that I think is very important. So I was surprised, pleasantly so, when with, with you know, Maxon and Redshift combined decided, you know, standard material, standard surface is going to replace everything else. The Redshift material is gone. I think, you know, it's physical. <clears throat> As found a little bit earlier, right? I think physical is going to be replaced by Redshift CPU. These are good things because Redshift itself has adopted something very close to the standard material. And my goal with the two of them, you know, the other two renders, is that between the three of us, it's there's barely any conversion for, on the on the core material side. We just we just figure out what the difference differences are, and it just kind of works, um, at least at the, at that core material node level. I think that's very doable. And I think that when we have the switch switcheroo, one thing that, you know, it's in one of the videos we added in the 2023 piece where you see, and it's not with, with Arnold, um, they didn't have time to, to make that video. It was just the last minute for Black Friday. I'm showing the Pixar Storm Render, which is another multi-render option. Mm -hmm. And then I'm taking a texture, and this is in the GPU compositor that's in 2022, where you could take CryptoMap, for example, and those get fed into the GPU compositor live, and you can then take material and you could swap between the two renders, and it's live, so you can actually have your subsurface from Arnold being fed into the, you know, replacing or being have a slider or an OSL shader that blends that with the one from, um, you know, from Octane. And it's it's wild the things you could do with those, you know, with, with having the renders so closely aligned. And in our case, mm -hmm. right within the core of Octane, if you're loading up Arnold as a render through our system or Redshift or any others, then we take care of the material conversion, so it still feels like it's one single Octane material at the top. Um, and then it gets converted and back into these other ones on the other side. And, and ultimately, we want to make it so that it just works so well that you don't need to worry about converting materials, at least if you're starting with one material system, 
it'll do that conversion for you. And we're not picking, you know, infinite number of renders. We're focusing on, on Arnold and Redshift as two others. Storm would be a third. And of course, we internally, we have our own with, with Octane and Brigade and others. So, mm-hmm. um, but I think that's, I think the idea of multi-render is very powerful because not everything is necessarily all done by one render, or even within one company's set of renders, right? Um, you, you know, you still have Corona and V-Ray over at, at, at Chaos, right, for, you know, for different things. And one's, you know, a CPU render, one's a GPU render. So I think that there's a lot of value in, in giving that kind of flexibility. Although I think, of course, with the Octane and Brigade and even some of the stuff we're doing, like the anime render, which also, by the way, will ship and will work mm-hmm. with, uh, you know, 2023, uh, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot there. But I, I think that with Octane itself, we're, we're getting, especially with some of the stuff we're doing towards real time, um, you know, we're hoping to, to capture a lot of the value for, for all sorts of different you know, things up until maybe NPR rendering. But there's always uh, other things you're seeing in renders, like Random Walk 2 in Arnold is great. Like, I think that's something yeah. unique to that render that I love, you know, so. And, and Ahmed is amazing. I cannot believe yeah. how fast he works <laughs> sometimes. Uh, he's He's got the pyro stuff working now already working Cinema it's 4D. amazing i can't believe it and you know i personally i'll probably do kind of a hybrid of both i really love the vdb loader because the mm-hmm. way that 2023 works with pyro now it when it caches it just makes the vdb files you just bring them right into a vdb loader i like to do like here's the sim over here i lock it in put a vdb mm-hmm. loader over here over there do it over here again but it is nice to have uh that version of it to where you can do a pyro sim and see it in your viewer you know and and tweak it or whatever you need to do uh Mm -hmm. maybe before you lock in your vdbs or something but i cannot believe how fast he's doing that yeah that i downloaded 2022.1 and i mean it's it's one maxon made it so easy to make pyro and then y'all added the ability, you just add a tag, and it's like, okay, now we can see it in, in Octane. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, now you're cooking with yeah. fire. Right? <laughs> yeah. Ding. And, and Pyro is great. Pyro is great. <clears throat> I mean, it really was something that, you know, especially as we're looking at, at you know, we've, we've obviously you know, know the TFD guys well, working with the Embridge guys, but I mean, honestly, to see that, you know, be integrated so nicely in, in Cinema 4D, I mean, it, it makes things a lot easier, and it's great to just be able to, you know, um, it's great. I mean, to be able to sort of ingest that directly is, is fantastic. And um, and I do think that, you know, the way that Embergen, for example, is heading, I mean, I think the direction we're heading with them is they're, they want to, and I think they're focusing on a standalone tool, which is, it, it, it by itself is fantastic. And we're going to create a bridge to that versus a direct integration. I think that's one of the things that also, I think just seeing Pyro work as well as it does in C4D, it just feels like that's where the best value add for Embergen is going to be. Um, but I just think it's great to see, you know, the core of Cinema 4D just have this functionality and for us to be able to adjust it really nicely. Maxon's been great. I mean, they, you know, one thing we should also talk about at some point is the fact that they've licensed us all of the C4D engine, which is how we can get C4D files to run inside of um, the yeah. render network directly, you know, or that's exporting. That's something else we showed um, recently. And, uh, and along with that, we also, of course, get Redshift that'll go alongside Arnold. But we yeah. also have the Maxon engine within the core. So in theory, we could have Octane standalone load a C4D file, render it, maybe do something closer to what is done on Deadline, where you can set up different nodes that just can load a C4D file. Yeah, I think the video you're showing there is from mm-hmm. my um, my talk in uh, you know, Lisbon, where you're, you're dragging a C4D file onto the render network, and it's spitting out a Redshift render, which the C4D file includes an RX proxy, coming to the Redshift benchmark. And it's interesting, they, even though it's a bucket render, it's being mapped to Octane Bench uh, and, and you get charged mm-hmm. for it just like you would an Octane render. And it's amazing because, you know, it's, it's showing the render network probably in its full utility, which is we're not actually using really Otoy software. I mean, other than the underlying yeah. system, it's running as, you know, it's running the Maxon's engine, it's running Maxon's render and it's delivering, you know, this output. And uh, it's, it's awesome. So I think the render network has this huge forward, um, you know, momentum with, with, you know, software beyond ours. The other thing that we showed in that same presentation was a lot of stuff related to you can run stable diffusion on the render network. Ooh. Uh, stable diffusion Ooh. 2.0. And yeah, and there's also in that in that same talk, um, there's also images showing stable diffusion as a node for textures, displacement, even. Um, oh, you know, oh man. <laughs> image to death. Yeah, there's, there's, there's prompts. So you can, your prompts become essentially a render job. And it's wild and the thing is there's there's a lot of stuff that's that that i think 
we can improve on you know in that model where it's like running a stable diffusion job or any of these you know mid training the same thing it can take a, it can take 10 to 40 seconds to generate you know a result whereas if you get mm-hmm. the actual asset back and then you can mix that that's pretty cool and so there's yeah. a lot of um work in 2023 with nurse which is i think going to be the format of choice mm-hmm. for future ai you know in, in other words instead of getting back an, an image or even a 3d model you're going to get back a nerve and corridor you know Ren, or, i was going to say corridor Ren, just did a, a video on it yeah yeah exactly so so nerves are what we were showing back in march which was this ai neural rendering pipeline you could take a 3d object you could turn it into a nerve that was you know and in 2023 we can render nerves directly but now there's tools you can t- take a nerve you turn it into an sdf you turn it into a vectron object which is something that we've been aiming for for a while so Vectron is, is essentially that shader-based system where you can you know, do all this crazy blending. That, I think, is the future of AI art, where you can essentially, you know, a, a, an artist basically gives a prompt, gets back essentially Vectron shapes or objects, and is able to blend those together and even ask or prompt, what is the operation? I want this thing to sort of melt into that. And, and I think those, those, you know, that decomposability of the render graph with just natural language input is the future, along with you know, fairly easy to use tools that you know, not just you know, high-end artists who've been studying this for years can, can do, but just anybody being able to mix those together and get great results. It's still rendering, and I still think that rendering is is the final step, not AI pure AI generation. I think you can have that still be you know, sugared in in post um, with things like style transfer, but yeah, AI rendering and uh, and even what's possible today with stable diffusion and mid journey is, I mean, such a game changer from where we were a year ago. And I think we've got another six months of exponential AI growth on those yeah. on those services before we're at nerf generation and, and, and all that. So for us, Octane 23 is meant to be right in line with all of that sort of coming together and making sure we've got an excellent workflow that's easy to use, render networks hooked up to handle all the heavy lifting. And, uh, and of course, you know, we're also supporting things like iPad and probably iPhone by middle next year as well. Mm-hmm. That's and that's amazing. all the, the neural rendering stuff, right? That's all related. Yeah. Um, so are so how is that going to work like i i vaguely remember the the last time we spoke i think it was june of this year we were talking about it a little bit um is it's so it's able to do some recreation stuff uh as well as bring it it's basically doing nerf stuff right am i getting that correct yeah so the, the, that is correct if you look at back of the video and it was almost like back then in march it felt like nerf was too too esoteric of a term to use but it generates nerfs for you and it generates it you just take the you know any bounding part of your scene like imagine it's an orbex proxy or you're exporting it to orbex for example and it's you're just selecting a bunch of geometry it just takes the bounding volume turns it into a nerf and then once that nerf is generated on render or locally right it then loads it back in and then you can render that nerf as if it were a volume or a mesh or vdb okay. or an wow. sdf or a vectron yeah. and and that that so that and the thing is what we discovered is that nerf itself isn't necessarily the best version of that either it's nice to have because you can then apply other ai filters to it but we can also apply ai filters directly to an sdf or a vectron in fact latent space and and sort of vectron space you know which is how these things get calculated are easy to mix so the idea is that once you generate a nerf you can turn that into something that's more more of a of a mesh or an object that you can then apply all these other operations to. But there's there's more there's more things you could do with that. And also I don't think that nerfs are the ultimate end goal. Like even in the Carter videos, they're saying, well you can't really relight it. So the ultimate goal is that you can mm-hmm. come up with a neural representation which can be relit, but it can be blended and tweaked. I mean imagine the you know the things you can do when something's a volume or a sign distance field or which is what Vectron does, where you can just take an object and you can just I don't know, create a, you know change the surface for another or blend these things together. That's what neural networks are great at doing. That's how you can get, you know, a unicorn Darth Vader ready, a unicorn doing ice fishing. <laughs> I mean, it just kind of takes <laughs> things it knows and it, and, it, and it composes them. And those operations are things that now, especially with uh, stable diffusion two, where you have depth input, which is not much, but it just gives you a depth map. It's able to really, you know, kind of isolate parts of the scene better. And we can do that times a thousand with proper neural rendering pipeline. And then once you get it, the idea is you can then spin the camera around and it's it's rendering with Brigade or Octane in near real time. Um, and that I think is also going to be cheaper than telling it to render it from a different angle or, or always generate a nerf. So neural rendering to me covers a lot of different pieces. It covers the ability to take your scene, turn it into something that is pure machine learning as far as rendering, mix that with machine learning operations, mix the text uh, to, you know, image, text to 3D stuff. 
and come up with a, a complete pipeline that incorporates all of that um, and keeps the interface simple. What are you going to do as far, like, will you be able to load specific libraries, like custom libraries? I know people have like all these different training libraries mm -hmm. for yeah. AI. Like, will you be able to say, okay, well, you know, I have a, a Star Wars uh, AI that I trained. Can I bring this in? You know, is that coming too? Yeah, so you can, you, you know, there's, if you go to Hugging Face, which has, which hosts a yeah. lot of the, uh, it's not just the Able Diffusion, it hosts a lot of different uh, AI tools. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the module that we're plugging into Render and into Octane can load pretty much anything from Hugging Face. And the reason for that is that people can publish their, you know, this is my anime 2.0, you know, this, this style. And the idea is that as long as there's a, you know, some sort of space or call-out in Hugging Face that we can pull from and, and validate, those could be loaded back in. The other thing that's clear is that if you want to give it six images, which is typically like a lot of these things on Hugging Face, when you want to train something, you just give it a few images and it adds it to Stable Diffusion and it gives you something back. We'll have the same sort of thing, but I think we could do something even better, which is like if you have an object or something that you've created, generate a nerf from that archetype of nerf and then feed that in as a as a type or a style or something that you want um, to, to have the AI be able to match. And I think that's where, you know, make it look like like this this scene you know, or this object is something that I think becomes really interesting from a training perspective. Obviously, training on 2D images is fine, but I do think that a rendered image or a rendered object is even better um, mm -hmm. where possible. So when you're looking at how text to 3D works, they're typically training that a lot on ShapeNet, which is about 40,000 images. It, oddly enough, you can also just download those 40,000 images, like I don't know, 30 gigs or something, and, and, and give people all those different um, you know links to those objects and blend them together. But I do think that the other option that we have is once you already send something to the render network, you can have a flag that says train my own um, you know, set of things on you know, the assets going into this render and the output of it. Very important mm -hmm. also that if you want people to use your, your artwork in any sort of AI job, if you have the render network be the way that goes in there, you could charge for that, you can certainly validate for it. All those things are why provenance on render is so important. It's not mm -hmm. just for NFTs. It is for proof of who created this first, what style is being used. You know, all of that becomes uh, pretty critical. Provenance is more than just, you know, valuing NFTs. It's, it is showing who created what. And it's such an important part of, of, you know, separating, you know, where art's coming from. And a lot of the angst around AI art comes from, you know, whether or not, you know, artists are getting a fair shake from their, their styles being used in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in these prompt generators. Yeah, I see things like uh, Dforum, which is using like 3D coordinates now in AI. I haven't been able to get it working yet. I tried for hours. I just couldn't get the just everything installed correctly. But I can't wait to play with that. I've been playing with the browser version of that that somebody has set up. Um, but as an artist, I, I don't know. I feel like I've been a, I feel like I've been a technical artist my whole life uh, up until now. And now I now that I'm getting older, I'm trying to. <laughs> Be more of a storyteller i'm trying to maybe put some stuff out there make some some shorts whatever you know and for me yep. i'm trying to tell a story and so whatever makes me have to deal the least with like technical stuff is best because i'm trying to get from point a to point z tell a story you know mm -hmm. so so to be able yep. to have whatever app i'm using for 3d whatever it is and to be able to have AI help with all of these little things. That's that's what's really interesting to me. You know, like if, if, if I'm designing some sort of big scene, Matt, you've done this before, you, you're doing a large scene, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start building it and you're like, what did I get myself into? Because yeah. <laughs> like, it's easy to make a small scene most of the time, but when you get a big scene, sometimes you're dealing with big assets and lots of texturing and it's like, and maybe it's not anything you've never done before. It's just time consuming. The, the time consuming part of it is what I feel like is really going to help because if AI can do these little tasks for you, even like think about textures and stuff, you know, yeah. if you've got a whole bunch of buildings in the background and you just make some cubes and you say, hey, turn this into a, a cityscape back there. I don't, you know, I don't care what exactly what it looks like. We'll tweak it. That's really interesting to yep. me. So mm -hmm. I mean, just I, I love would, that y'all are thinking that far forward on this stuff. So could 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 you implement stable diffusion as its own node you know within uh, it is its own node it, 
it's crazy. It's, it's, so if you go to my Twitter post, which is mm -hmm. what I used also in the um, my, my talk at Salon in Lisbon, which we should drop a link to and it, just so people can see it, mm -hmm. there's about 10 slides. And it's also something I post on Twitter, which literally shows, and this is shipping in 2023. It's not just stable diffusion. It's just an AI node. And you select stable diffusion one, stable diffusion two, five other different models that are in a hugging case. And it basically, it's a texture baker. In other words, you get back whatever the, the prompt is, because the prompt itself is a deterministic function, right? If you tell Stable Diffusion 2 with this C to give you back this image, it's done, and it's essentially a final render job. So if you to put the same prompt in and it's been generated once on network, it's like, you know, so it's like running the render job again. There is a node that does that, and that's what I was showing you know, in those in those tweets, is that you have you, you don't need to go to live DB or, or get wood textures anymore. Like it's pretty damn good to say I want this chestnut type of wood, and it gives you back this thing in the material preview in octane, and you're done. And I'm just like, holy crap, that's pretty cool. And same thing with marble. I, li I like this, you know, glaze marble with with you know gold veins in it, and and it's crazy. It gives you all that back. That's what I was showing in there, and it takes a few seconds, and it runs on the render network, and and. We're going to give, give you the uh, ability to run it locally as well. You can run your own stable diffusion server locally. We'll have Octane and Soft running as a, as a um, it's a little bit, it's going to be essentially what we've been talking about for headless rendering, um, mm -hmm. where we had headless rendering in Blender for like 10 years, the entire time. What's changing in Octane 2023 uh, is that that headless rendering server uh, will be called like the render server. It'll run in your, like the system tray app, and any version of Octane standalone uh, mm -hmm. over LAN, not just on the same machine, will be able to connect to it and use it as a GPU render node for everything, not just doing network rendering, but just everything, denoising the whole works. That will work in C4D, it'll work in Unreal, it'll work in any of the plugins, and it'll work on the very same machine, which is kind of, remember, we're probably talking like for years about how if, if Octane crashes, C4D shouldn't. This will yeah, solve right. that because it's going to be running it headlessly. Mm -hmm. um, Blender users have had the benefit of that forever, but now it'll work in, in everything. Even the iPad app we're about to release, if you load a scene that's bigger than what the yeah, 8 gig iPad could load, for example, you can send it over to the you know, to the little system trap running on your, your Mac or your PC, mm -hmm. and it'll run. You know? and so your 4090 can be powering your IPR and your final render on on the iPad app or anywhere. Nice. And that's a big deal too. We've been working on that for a long time. So that kind of means also that, you know, you can have a CUDA device powering your, um, you know, your metal version of Octane. And uh, and in that same node, in that same setup, we're also gonna drop in the stuff that's on render. So you'll be able to do um, stable diffusion, all that stuff without going to the render network. You'll have both those switches. And the idea is that if you're able to send stuff to this local node, um, you'll also be able to get the same experience sending it to render, including the ability to get a, a viewport live. So if you just want to have no GPUs and just get a 4090 or the equivalent of that from the render network, that will be available. That's probably one of the more useful types of live streams that we'll offer. And it'll cost you more than just doing an offline render, but hopefully not you know, hugely significant amount more. Uh, and then there's there's even other elements on top of that that we're going to be offering, like the ability to load your Orbex into an Unreal stream, edit it, send mm -hmm. that back to the network. Uh, many other things along those lines, uh, some of which we also showed in, the, in that Lisbon talk with uh, with Beeple and his, um, you know, his artwork being sort of edited, you know, by anybody, right? And then you can sort of save it back as an Orbex and that can generate um, an NFT or or a finalized render on on the render network, and uh, and so there's so many different functions that we could be building on top of the foundation that we have today for offline rendering. Nice. That's I've got so cool. I've got this uh, link here too. Um, I think um, it's in the uh, it's in the chat now too. If you want to, if anyone else wants to bookmark that. Ah um, uh, yes. I love the idea mm -hmm. of the you know I I love sitting in my in my office and working, but you know there are times. I'm Matt, I'm sure you do this too, where it's like I just want to grab my laptop and work on something mm -hmm. on the couch for a minute, and yeah. just you know maybe if it's just a quick update or something, so I don't have to go up. To my, I know it's you know first world problems right but right. the head, headless rendering like mm -hmm. to be able to just bust out your laptop and work on something real quick mm -hmm. is is really valuable instead of having to like you know power up a giant machine to to do a little change or something uh, that's something that we've been looking forward to for a while and, and sometimes even when you're on your own machine if you've got something else running uh, I mean I, I know people stream their content sometimes uh, when they're mm -hmm. modeling you know and uh, sometimes it's kind of hard to do that if you're working in Octane trying to stream at the same time you can use headless have your other machines do the some of the hard work while you're streaming and um, so there's a lot of applications for that. I love that. 
let me ask you this, Jules. So you yeah. talked about like having your own. It's like it's almost like an own internal render network or whatever, right? Yeah. Would it be Would it be possible, like, say I've got my own little render network set up here? Would it be possible for, say, for example, me to be at the coffee shop working and being able to headlessly mm. render across Remotely. over the network, Jeez. similar, you know, like using my own render network? You know what I'm saying? That's exactly the point, actually. Um, and so, so it works pretty well over LAN. I mean, you know, for example, I mean, one of the stress tests is you're on the iPad, which has mm -hmm. to be wireless pretty much, and you're running it off of a you know, 4090 on the PC, and that works fine. I mean, that works in real time. I mean, it's you know, it's pretty smooth, 30 frames a second IPR. Um, it's, it's possible that it, that could also run from your coffee shop. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from going, we're not blocking it from working over the, uh, over the internet either. And the reason for that is that we could set up a node on the render network somewhere, which is exactly that. I mean, that, that live streaming, that sort of mini you know, local rendering piece is important. And it also will do queuing. Like one of the things we're working on is that if you are rendering locally, and the iPad, frankly, even the iPhone can do pretty good rendering. I mean, it's, it's not mm -hmm. super fast, but it's pretty good in the IPR. It's just noisy. And the idea is that if you wanted to sort of finish that render on that little node that you have running locally, it is like a mini rendered node, right? And that's the idea is we want to eventually merge the, the, the render offline cloud service with this local version that is being deployed for 2023 so that you can kind of mix those together and it becomes sort of one influx, both for live rendering, if you want to pay that premium outside of your LAN, um, but also if you have a 4090 and you're anywhere in the world, you just want to connect to it and you know, power it that way, that should work. Um, but also it, it just means that if you want to queue up final renders, they can be queued up nicely on your local system. And, and that also is something that I think is going to be useful for asynchronous rendering. Like one nice thing that Arnold added was the ability for you to run almost two current renders within one plugin, right? And Octane doesn't really do that. I mean, you can load another Octane process um, and which is what we're, we're using. So you can load multiple sessions on that little Octane, you know, system tray app locally mm -hmm. and, and, and do like four different renders on the same GPU. That is something that kind of has been blocked in the current system. So we, we are adding both asynchronous rendering, rendering over the, you know, over the network and ultimately oh. having a system that you can kind of send the same job to a local rendered you know, node that you can just, you know, have handled you know, handle you know, asynchronous and live jobs and then send that to the cloud as well and even mix those together, ultimately get the same results. I love how every time we talk to you, I, I keep on thinking, okay, we're going to hit the end of, you know, the great stuff. And then you just keep on bringing it forward and making, <laughs> you know, you're you're so ahead of this. I, I'm just, I'm constantly amazed at how, how far ahead you're thinking on this. And it, it's it's awesome. Yeah, it is pretty funny because it's like, oh, well, maybe you could do this. And you're like, yeah, yeah, we're doing that already. Yeah, we're doing so, <laughs> uh, but, um, the, okay, we'll here, the But here's the thing, though, is bandwidth is, is the concern, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you're rendering locally, you don't want to use Wi-Fi. I mean, you can. Right. But you want to use a, a, yeah. a, a you know, hardwired connection. You want to have the fastest network possible because, you know, if you're like me, you're doing a giant scene. You've got, like, gigs of textures and things that mm -hmm. need to go over the network. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to render remotely, that's going to that's probably going to be your biggest pinch in the pipeline, right? Like it is. There is one thing that that, that could kind of that, that could help, which is that if you now when you're running a render job on the render network, what happens is it, you know you're not just you know you may send an orbex and now you're sending a C4D file, but every single piece that goes into that orbex textures, for example, meshes, those get hashed. There's, and this is why it, mm -hmm. it, it works a lot like a blockchain, even before we move to the render network on Ethereum. You know, it, it, essentially, you can tell a render node, instead of sending it the data, just send it, you know, this, this scene has already been hashed on the render network, and I want this node to pull in the scene. That's mm -hmm. how the render network works. Like when we load it on some random user machine, it gets a render job, which is a simple text file, and then it pulls in all the components mm -hmm. from the render network, and it doesn't have to be sent directly from one node. It can get, it can sort of be aggregated. So if you're on a coffee shop connection and you're saying, I want to load, I have this scene, I want to send it over, but it hashes that scene. It does delta syncing to render, so it wouldn't re-upload the whole scene just to do a render job. That can work the same way on your local nodes. You can mm -hmm. cache that scene locally, and it'll only send the changes. And that's something right. that we're applying. I think that works already in on render right now. If you go into 2022 standalone, um, I think the final version does have the ability to delta sync. We always had that on Orc, you know, the old precursor to render, which was centralized. And that same system is something I want to apply to the local version of, of render where, you know, those your, your nodes, your, your things can be cached 
and that I think will help significantly. I mean, certainly if you're sending, if you're generating massive new textures and you're sending those all all out again, yes, bandwidth is going to matter. Right. But there's always ways of, of you know improving that. Um, and I will say that you know bandwidth is getting better, you know, not worse. Mm -hmm. So that always is is um, is helpful. But the Delta syncing system will make a big difference. Uh, and there's another feature that I think is worth pointing out, which is uh, in the um, Again, in the 2023 preview blog post, uh, there's a link showing, you know, hey, what's coming in 2023? Neural rendering, but also meshless. So mm -hmm. meshless yes. is another feature we should discuss. Mm -hmm. It's worth showing that video or giving people the link to it if they if they can. It's uh, it's it's a technology that is essentially the same as anyone that's familiar with Unreal. There's something called Nanite. And mm -hmm. Nanite is something that will take your, your, your meshes, no matter how big they are, and, and squeeze it down into a format that can then be pulled in live as you're streaming through the scene. And that, that works great in Unreal. We've gotten and built a system that is very similar to that, directly in the core of Octane. So what we've been, you know, we had another video that we made for Black Friday. I don't think I got a chance to post it, but it, it essentially shows that you're using about a gig of memory for to render live a 60 gigabyte scene. And what's happening is it's pulling in just the pieces, the textures and the, and the geometry that it needs for that one frame which isn't necessarily a full 60 gigs, and then it's giving you back the, um, you know, it's giving you back just that piece. And it's amazing because it means that you don't have to worry about whether you got an 8 gig card or a 60 gig card or out of core or any mm -hmm. of it. It's, it's essentially like streaming out of core. And it doesn't need an SSD. It, it does need probably about, you know, you know, essentially a gigabyte of, of, of bandwidth, right, which is 10 gigabit E if you have that. So you can even do streaming over the network or over over land if you've got enough bandwidth. So it doesn't have to be from a, a fast SSD. But that's, I think, a game changer as well because it means that the scene size doesn't have to be limited by out of core or system memory. It can just be streamed directly into the GPU. And potentially, potentially that could even run over um, over the wire. You know, I mean, 10 gigs over the internet is is definitely like rare, but it's not, it's not an impossible um, mm -hmm. thing in the future. So, yeah, that's the thing that I'm really interested in because um, I I tend to, well, I mean, it's my own fault, but I I <laughs> bring in all these high res textures, you know, when I'm working on stuff because sometimes I don't know like how close is the camera going to be to it and mm -hmm. you know all this stuff. I'll end up with some four and eight K textures sometimes. And, and that's the biggest uh, pinch point for me right now is sometimes I just have like so many gigs worth of textures, it takes a while to get the thing going. So so basically this would stream and it wouldn't be loading the VRAM with textures, is that right? Yep, yeah, that video there is showing a 300 megabyte buffer and it's about 40 gigs. We, we did another video, I'll post that probably at some point this coming week, which has 60 gigs running at about a one gig buffer, seven, eight, 800 megabytes, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, and that includes texture. So you have a 128K by 128K texture. I think that maybe shows, it's shown in that video as well, that gets, you know, that gets pulled in and you don't have to worry about how big it is. And you can then have an entire, just massive set of textures and, and geometry that just gets loaded and is needed. Now there are some limitations. I mean, it's, it's like the forming it is, complicated we're working on ways of, of making that work um but it's but ultimately just being able to have just these large textures and large geometry elements that get you know essentially streamed in is is a huge game changer and i think it means that you know a lot of what differentiates the cost of gpus is how much vram they have so if you can mm -hmm. again sort of load in these scenes with less vram uh that's great and we can use the vram for other stuff that's that's probably more important or that's necessary for live compositing or live um, mm -hmm. streaming in real time. Yeah, I was going to mention that too, because, you know, that's, that's a big advantage. There's a lot of people that, oh, I got my new, you know, 3090 or I got my new 4090 and then they have these older cards. Well, mm -hmm. you're going to be limited to yeah. VRAM in those cards. If yep. you put those cards on the network, you know, you're, you're obviously they've got a smaller amount of VRAM. So you're going to, um, be a little limited in that way and if you if you had this it wouldn't be so much of a concern i guess mm -hmm. you know yeah. um, i don't know if that's still yeah. is that still the case that that you can only go as high as the lowest card well it sort of is i mean it depends on what mode you're using so first of all NVLink is dead so nvidia kind of killed it with the 4090s mm -hmm. they just took it out period mm -hmm. from everything even the high-end cards don't have it anymore um so all we really have is as out of core and the out of core right. stuff can work you know it can work differently per card that is something that it is supposed to be the case 
in practice, I mean, mixing these things can lead to weird results because you're going to get very different speeds between rendering out of core versus in core. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, yeah, I mean, so in some ways, the lowest VRAM you have in a, in a mixed setup might certainly impact the total speed uh, versus if everything fits in core, you're going to get the maximum speed possible. But if you're out of core, it might be, you know, half the speed, a quarter of the speed. We don't know. It depends on, the, on how much is out of core. Um, but yeah, it's something that with meshless streaming, at least, you know, the full speed will be there because it's gonna, it's essentially gonna be feeding into the into the VRAM, into both GPUs essentially um, the same way, and you're not gonna be getting that same speed hit. I mean, that's the beauty of it is it'll mm -hmm. it'll construct the scene using only this much, you know, VRAM, and it, and it's it's within a gig, right? I mean, we, you know, it's maybe if you have, I don't know, a uh, you know, hundred gig scene, it'll be it'll be two gigs of VRAM. It's something along those lines, like it's one fiftieth the size. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of um, you know, a lot of room there. And I think most modern cards, you know, they've got eight gigs, twelve gigs, you know, something yeah. like that. So I think we're, we're it, it'll be it'll be much more useful. And more importantly, it means the scene sizes could just be essentially infinite. And and that also yeah. means if something isn't shown, by the way, it takes up zero VRAM. And if it is cool. far away, then it doesn't pull in, you know, all of what's needed. It, it essentially it's it's a little bit like I guess what mint mapping would do, except it's much more sophisticated because obviously mint mapping for geometry doesn't necessarily work. Um, and, and and very much like Unreal, where there's a flag where you can say I want this to be you know used for nanite, you just hit a checkbox and it nanites it for you. While the same thing for mesh lets it'll it'll operate the same way. Anything that's sort of in this you know connected to this node or this geometry group textures everything you know checkbox let it stream and it will. That's how it'll uh, that's how it'll work. That'll help What's... for a lot of those scenes. Like I, you know, I know a lot of people use mega scans and stuff, and they'll bring in these. Oh, here's a rock, yeah. and they'll put it in. Oh, it's 24 million polygons for this yeah. one rock. <laughs> you know, like, and some yep. people, you know, are not who are new or not even aware that that's a big deal or how to optimize a scene or anything like that. So I, I feel like that's going to help too. Uh, what were you going to say, Matt? Sorry. I was just going to say, like, uh, how far into the future are we looking at an implementation into this? You know, I'm not going to hold you to any timelines or anything, <laughs> but are, are are you looking at, like, so, hey, this may be available in 2023, 2024, you know? Uh, oh, yeah. It's a 20, it's it's intended to be second half of, of uh, 2023. So, you know, we're, we're, I mean, it'd be great to get it in, into 2023.1, probably just given how, how hard it's been to get this point. Um, no, but it, it, it is something we're aiming for by the, by this time next year, we want to ship meshlets in, in 2023. So Amazing. that's the plan. And, and like everything, things, things slip. I mean, even with Brigade, it's like we wanted to ship, so, and we should all look at how Brigade is working and how yeah. 2023 is working. Yeah, absolutely. Those, um, like that's really cool. But you know, there's there's pieces of so there are two parts I, th I think to the um, to the meshlet stuff. One of which is definitely going to be in twenty twenty three dot one, which is complete refactoring of how memory itself works. We've been slowly making those changes, making Octane more memory efficient. Um, I think the final sort of iteration of that will be in the first half of twenty twenty three, and if possible, we'll get meshlets in there. But most likely, even if we can hook those things together, as we found even with the game in twenty 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 two they make things unstable, right? And we want to ship stable releases. So when getting, when 2022, there's originally going to be two versions of it, not just 2022.1. Mm. The reason why it sort of went all year was because we were looking at how much of brigade can we put in this without causing, you know, issues that would just make something unstable and not have everything we'd want to have in brigade in the end anyway. And so towards the end of, of this year, as we were shipping the stable version, we we're like, I'm just going to take the temporal denoiser piece and other things and put them in 23. We've got other things that we didn't even announce yet or, sh or show until like you know last Friday, including mm -hmm. subsurface scattering and other things that are going into Brigade Two. And what, what, what did ship in 2022, um, for example, at the end of it was that you have this real-time mode. That real-time mode Notice when you turn that. it on, especially like on a 4090. There's also th something that shipped in like the last month of this 2022 goals, which is a much different sampling thing. If you look at the noise in just a few samples, it's much cleaner than it used to be even in the early betas of, of 2022. So what's, what's happening is you have a lot of what Brigade was before we added the temporal denoiser and some of these other pieces that are in 2023 now that are shipping in the foundation of 2022. And what that real-time mode is doing is it's running everything on the GPU. So there's no CPU film buffered, nothing is on, is out of core for the actual, you know, for that piece of it, because in order for the Brigade to run at full speed, it does need to be in core for the most part. Um, by the way, meshlets will still run in Brigade. And then what we're adding in 2023 was the piece that was, it's called Brigade Mode or Brigade Kernel. That adds a temporal denoiser. And yeah. some of those things were what I was showing where you see the left and right side of the screen, but there's also other, many other things where it's like what we want to do is even if you don't add that temporal denoiser, where can we speed up 
rendering to the point where one sample per pixel gets you something that is all so that's yeah what you're showing there is yeah. this subsurface scattering subsurface so the left mm -hmm. is with yep and that is using you know brigade subsurface on the left the traditional option wow. one on the right and in, in, yeah in 2023 you can switch it on or off or you can do the split screen just which i was using here to show the difference and what's cool is that brigade does render final renders like octane does it, it, instead of getting you know, less noisy, it gets more detailed. So the only slight thing that happens with the temporal denoiser um, or any of these effects is that it, it'll get, it'll be a little bit blurrier maybe than a final render, but it'll get less blurry over 30, 40 samples um, if it even needs it. Mm -hmm. But I think in this case, the subsurface scattering is such a radical difference, you can almost call it done really on, on mm -hmm. the uh, on the real time side. <clears throat> and we've also changed, you know, 2023 is also adding a whole new system for spotlights. Like we're going to you know, we have Arnold standard surface, Arnold standard volume. Frankly, we're going to add just Arnold lights, which I love. Like they have one object. This is what's, what that is. I, you can't even see the left because it's so noisy. <laughs> yeah. On the right, though, is the new version. This is not using any denoising. This is just Octane 2023 using what is basically a new light, you know, new set of lights um, that gives you proper spotlights, proper point lights, you know, multiple distant lights, which have never really been possible in Octane. Mm -hmm. And sure if we add the denoiser on top of that it's even better but that kind of effect is is hugely important i mean that's just one sample of pixel that i you're was gonna say this is one sample on the left right? right side oh yeah so wow. that means that's that's a huge improvement that is separate from any of the other brigade stuff we've shown before it just means when you feed that into everything else we've got it's going to be even faster and then there's other stuff we've done with the environment you know fog scattering you know we, we showed stuff before where it's like we had spectron and these things and it was faster but this is also like one sample per pixel for the environment medium it, for scattering for, for fog is pretty much instantaneous. And it works well enough that you can, again, you can almost like the light mixer, you can change the color, you can change its density after it's rendered, which is kind of nice. Um, yeah, this is the Octane 2, I think splash screen that was, I used to take like 10 minutes to just, you know, get a slightly clean render. And now it's real time and that's also without using any of the temporal denoising that's running in um you know 2023 on a single 4090 wow but it's it's fully yeah it's pretty great wow uh, and then we have a whole set of camera effects for uh for super fast chromatic aberration glints um you know also instantaneous depth of field soon instantaneous motion blur those will be check marks that you'll lens flares? To add in sort of a real time yeah uh, yeah. lens, lens flares, and you kind of see it. That video is a little bit blurry, but those, yeah, yeah you're seeing th mm -hmm. those there. And you know, you could you could always sort of calculate these things live in in Octane the slow way. Now we've got a you know checkbox, do it fast, do it in in real time. Wow. Um, and in certain cases, you know, when you have things in the universal camera or just the normal camera, you just hit a checkbox. It'll detour the rendering so that it doesn't do it the old-fashioned way. It'll do it in the faster, um, almost instantaneous way. And I think that's kind of the way that artists will want it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where where you can have the, the ability to sort of move things into this almost, not just fast remote, but almost instantaneous render mode. Um, and maybe everything can be done that way and, and, and you get a final render you're happy with. I mean, that's ultimately where real time should go. Um, but the good news is with everything that we did and our, the time that we took to get Brigade done, I don't think we compromised anything. I mean, you still at least starting with the same scene, the same materials, nothing mm -hmm. has to change. Uh, it's pretty fast to switch between those different modes. And uh, and I think that what we will do beyond that is to allow you to, to switch to completely different renderers, um, even if they're, you know, do it offline or real time, because why not? And I think Unreal is one of those renderers where we've done, a, people don't realize how much work we've done and in tandem with Epic to essentially get it so that we can bring in Unreal into multi-render. And the, wow. the, the test we did with people was showing how you can, decouple that you can even take an orbex and bring it into an unreal app and render that and then you know and then flip a switch and go back to octane but we can also do it live and so i feel like like below the level of brigade you have essentially you have you know, the free pixar storm render and then you have unreal and i think that's a, you know that going up to brigade and then going up to the offline renders feels like it's the right spectrum um and the good news with unreal is it's a completely open source relatively easy library for us to integrate so when we look at adding, you know, the renders in 2023, you know, Pixar is again open source at Pixar Storm. Um, you know, Arnold they've given us a library that is watermarked, so you have to, if you have a license, you can get rid of the watermark. Redshift will be the same thing; it'll be watermarked unless you, you know, unless you own it. And when you send it to render, of course, it'll be unwatermarked. And with Unreal, I think once we add that in there, the idea is that you can just switch to that and have that work in multi-render. And uh, and the conversion again with Unreal 5.1, including standard surface. 
Um, and the great work we've done with just converting the craziness that's both in Unreal back into Octane and vice versa, I think is going to pay off when you can use Unreal and multi-render. And, and that's mm -hmm. also why we have to have meshlets. So if you're using Nanite, Nanite to, to, to meshlet conversion will work. All of that will work. Oh, wow. Um, it's, it'll be pretty sweet. Yeah. Yeah, virtual production is a big part of our, our, our goal with, with that integration as well. So you can run this on set and switch between Octane and Brigade and Unreal pretty seamlessly, both within an Unreal app and within, you know, Octane standalone or any of any the Octane DCC plugins. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, so uh, uh, with the with Brigade implementation into Unreal, uh, so if I'm creating a video game, I would be able to create the video game using the Octane engine instead of... Unreal's engine, correct? That is correct. Yeah. Now, you can also, Unreal does have, by the way, a path tracer, which it attaches Unreal 5, which is really good, actually. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not spectral. I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily, I think, yet competitive with, with even a commercial offline render, but it's very good. And I think that also is written in DirectX. And I think it's a great, it's, it's another layer above, but it also is, is, it's got a lot of blurriness. Like, it's not as fast even as some of the stuff we're showing in, in frankly, Octane 2023. So there is this thing where I think that, yes, yeah, switching to full path trace mode, I think we could even do a faster render than what Unreal's path tracer is doing. It's certainly Unreal itself. If we're, if we're you know, like, I was showing a test. I don't know if, if, if Dave can load it. it it's in the end of the 2023 blog post, right? At the very end, it, it's talking about the render delegate or multi-render. And I'm showing a video where it's the enterprise and it's showing, um, it's almost like a checkerboard pattern. Uh, and what that's showing is that we can run Octane and Brigade at 60 frames a second, and it keeps up with the simplest OpenGL viewport render, which means we can keep it up. Yeah, there you go. So that's, one of those checkerboards is, is oh, Octane. It's very fast. We might want to loop it uh, or pause it. But it's basically using an OSL shader just to blend the two renders together. And the crazy part is oh. that one of those is running Pixar Storm, which is OpenGL. The other is running Octane, and uh, you know, just the noisy version of it. But it's fast enough that you can move the camera around, and it, it is able to keep track, keep it up at, at 60 frames a second. So I do think that the ability for for us to take over and even take things that are partially rendered in Unreal, partially rendered in Brigade, and mix those together with an, a shader that you can define, like we, you know, to the right of that is the checkbox shader that's running in the GPU compositor, those things are all possible. And uh, and I think that's where you'll have games that are, you know, or Unreal apps that are, you know, that are able to keep up with the scene graph um, in Brigade mode and Octane mode or hell, anything that we want to throw into the mix and vice versa. Um, the other thing we're doing is you'll be able to create interactive blueprint nodes. Uh, we're doing that for the Star Trek uh, Roddenberry archive work that we're doing mm -hmm. and put package those in a very simple way, um, you know, into a stream, <clears> into <throat> a, um, you know, into a link and that's the thing we're showing again in that in that video, the people's um, you know the, one of his everydays, where you get a, a web link, a stream, where you have Unreal and Octane combined into one into one little applet, where you can kind of move things around, you can drop assets. It's kind of meant to be a very simple you know scene graph layout. And then when it's done, you can do a final render on the render network. I mean, you can also do a live render, but it's it's wild. I mean, that kind of interoperability between what Unreal can do and Brigade and Octane can do and mixing those together and being able to publish those things along with your art. To be honest, I think that's the future of crypto art, but it also is a big part of, you know, how I think the metaverse probably should work as well. I mean, that kind of interoperability between multiple engines, composability, that's a big deal. Uh, and of course, the metaverse now is it's a lot of different meanings. And, and I, I, I do sort of feel that Facebook taking the name has kind of changed it for you know, perception-wise, <laughs> mm -hmm. for a lot of people. So I just right. call it the spatial web. Um, you spatial know, web. and, and I think like people that. get it. But <laughs> I think it's spatial web. Well, I mean, it's 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 ultimately where I think, um, yeah, probably a better description of of what it all means in the end. But yeah, yeah there's a lot there. <clears throat> I'm so excited about Brigade. Um, mm -hmm. I know I keep bringing this back, uh, saying this as an artist, as an artist, as an artist who is 42 years old. I just cannot, I mean, I understand the importance of Unreal. I'm just not, like, I'm just not getting into Unreal. And, mm -hmm. like, for me, I, all I need is Brigade. I just want to be able to art direct a scene and see what it looks like and keep doing what I'm doing. I don't want to learn anything new yeah. right now. Uh, that's why I'm so excited about it. And I, it's not that I don't understand the importance of Unreal or anything else, but, you know, I just, yep. I have my workflow, and whatever makes it better is is great, so... Uh, I've been just like dreaming about Brigade since <laughs> Octane 2 was out and I was watching the initial videos you had yeah. because you were starting back then uh, on, on working on that. I know it's changed a little bit over the years, mm -hmm. but 
It's it's worth talking about why it's changed as well because we did have a brigade and thank God I showed it at SIGGRAPH 2012, right, and and earlier. So it's been it's been a decade, and you know we, we kind of we've been shipping pieces of brigade for a long time. Like Octane Four, you know, one of the big talents, it comes with brigade. And what that meant was that there's there's always been two parts of brigade, which is the tracing of the rays as you move your scene, which is which is was working in Octane Four. If you looked at how fast objects could move. It was mm -hmm. instantaneous. That was mm -hmm. half of brigade shipping in that version. What happened at the same time, though, is that you almost don't need that anymore with RTX. RTX was hardware that was able to do something very similar. So I was like, okay, well then for people that don't have an RTX card, this <clears throat> Octane 4 is, is absolutely critical. For people that do with RTX on, there's still stuff that we did in brigade there that was useful, but frankly, RTX changed the entire direction of how we looked at, at brigade, because in a sense, that was the, the tracing that we have to this day I think 2022 finally gives you the ability to do 4K at 60 frames a second. You can try it now on a 4090, it'll run, as long as the shading isn't too complicated. So the shading part of what, what Brigade offers is, is such a spectrum of different things. It's almost like we have to go piece by piece. Subsurface scattering is, is a switch. You know, lighting is another switch. The temporal denoiser is another switch. Because I think that if you, you know, we now have the ability to, to at least drive the, the ray tracing pretty cleanly. And that wasn't even possible at, at full speed, I think, in, in, in Octane 4 through 2021, because we were still, they're still back and forth in the CPU, which we eliminated in 2022. That real-time mode gives you now the ability to really run it at full interactive speeds. And, and, and right now, Brigade is just single GPU. It'll be dual GPU in 2023 by the time we're done. But I think that now with all the pieces we have and the temporal denoiser, that was one of the things that we were showing. You know, we saw, we're seeing the, um, you know, the truck scene and the Japanese garden scene. Those were using that temporal denoiser, adapting that to Octane itself and making that just work at anything close to that speed within the entire complexity we have. That was what took all of this year. And with that done, and not going into 2023, I think we're in a very good place. There is more that we can be doing, though. For example, the photon tracer that we added that does instantaneous mm -hmm. caustics. We want to apply that to do instantaneous GI and just to improve it. I mean, I think that there's real time is going to be just like offline. There's more and more things that we could be doing to improve how it works. Um, and Brigade right now, even in the current 2023 beta, the interior lighting interiors is still a bit a bit splotchy. We'll, you know, we'll be able to fix that, I think, within about four months. Um, but that's like, you know, there's just work that's been that's just, you know, ahead of us. On the other hand, I do think that 2023.1, which we're going to ship the first half of this coming year, will have a really robust version of Brigade that'll cover all these things, even the SSS working as well as it does. That's half subscription scattering. That was like, when I saw that, I was like, wow, that's one of the harder bits to solve. That's great. Mm -hmm. And I'm feeling pretty good about that. I, I do think that that you, the way that we will allow you to eventually use Unreal is it'll be a switch like Brigade that'll run even at C4D. So you don't mm -hmm. have to leave C4D or Blender to use Unreal in there. But I do think that there's something magical about having a spectral render oxygen quality and all these switches to get to this these, these results in, in essentially in, in real time. Yeah, and with Brigade, even if it's not doing everything right away, I think it's it's super valuable for just setting up a scene, for visualizing mm -hmm. a scene, for getting like, like some quick renders out for clients, instead of having to do like you know the obligatory like low sample version that you send the client they're like why right. is it grainy and it's like well right. this isn't the final version yet <laughs> you know so you can kind of yep. up up <clears throat> even the preview process there um there's some questions though uh i wanted to get to real quick before they disappear off my screen um uh, paul asks um about 2022 on render network um when when is that coming i'm sure that takes a little bit of time to yeah. to implement I would say I would say next month it should be ready to go. Um, you know, so we, we just put out the stable release, you know, Friday, and I would say give it about two weeks uh, before it's it's fully up and running on render. Um, but hopefully, when it is, it'll also work with the delta syncing mode that's inside of the standalone tool and yeah, potentially other other integrations as well. So I would just yeah say middle of December would be a reasonable time frame um, for 2022 stable to be fully available on on render. And uh, and for C4D uh, Arnold Redshift, that it, testing beta testing for that will will be first half of next year. Um, I mean that video we showed where it was working was just the very first, literally the very first render test we did. Um, so we're we're going to be opening up the beta for that. You know, I'd say Q1 of of 23. The beta for 2023 will probably also start uh, in December, and it'll if you're already on the 2021 beta Slack channel that we started two years ago, there's about 200 artists that will be the same Slack channel we'll be using for the 2023 uh, beta, and we'll probably open that up um, 
you know, mid next month, something along those lines. Is it still oh, iPad um, app also next month? Oh, yeah. I'm curious oh. about the iPad app. Uh, I wanted to ask about that because you know, dealing with nodes and the user interface on an iPad, I would assume could be cumbersome. <laughs> right. <clears throat> It, 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 you, it, you would assume correctly, and that's why the iPad app was, it, it's not out yet. And it's the only reason it's not out yet, or the iPhone app for that matter, isn't because it doesn't work, because it works great. Um, it, it just, the interface for touch was really, we had to rethink it. And we're still, in, frankly, the, the reason why probably it's a few more excited is we still want to clean up that touch interface. So it has to be super simple from a touch perspective. There's an easy mm -hmm. mode, which is a little bit like, you just move the thing with your, you know, with your, you know, hand. It changes the things like daylight and so. I mean, none of the nodes are even exposed. So the average user that's it just loads an Orbex scene of which there's, you know, you, you know, it's like you give you ten or twelve. It's really meant to be a test to see how simple we can make Octane standalone and still allow you to make an, a, an easy render. Um, there is a switch though that you can hit a button and it turns into the desktop version of standalone. And on an iPad, okay. and a trackpad, and a, and a keyboard. You have exactly the same experience you have on desktop, and now with I, you know iOS or iPad OS 16, you can hook it, hook it up to a, a big monitor, and you have uh, what it's called Stage Manager, same as it is on the desktop. And all of a sudden, you can have multiple mm -hmm. windows, and you have a desktop experience on an M2 iPad that is essentially the same as your, you know, desktop experience in an M2 MacBook, mm -hmm. um, with some limitations around the operating system. So, the idea with the iPad app is that you you do have Unlike a phone, you do have at least the ability to replicate exactly what a MacBook could do with a trackpad and a keyboard. So right. that mm -hmm. desktop mode in the iPad app makes a lot of sense because yeah. you never know if you're on the go and you don't have a MacBook, why not? Like yeah. my iPad always has the, the trackpad and keyboard and I use Octane Standalone on my iPad identically to the way that I do it on my MacBook. The touch version of it though is something that we're gonna release, whatever we have you know, in the version that's going out in next month will be a starting point, I think. It'll be much simpler. There'll even be two modes, a little bit like Procreate, where it's like giving me more advanced touch input versions. But I think that even there, we're gonna have like even the material so that you can change, it'll be just very simple. And if you just wanna set up a scene and change the daylight system and change you know, camera, you know, the, you know, the FOV of the camera, something simple like that, it'll, it'll handle that well. And what we're going to be doing is probably getting user feedback from you know the, the influx of users that will be coming into this app because it's completely free. You don't mm -hmm. even need to sign up for a Prime account. Um, it'll just work on your iPad. And we'll see how useful it is to people. But ultimately, there's going to be the touch interface, the keyboard, desktop interface, and then ultimately an AR interface, right? Because the phone and, and the iPad both have AR kit built in. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a utility in having, especially if you can do real time, um, you know, being able to block out your camera movements and have that happen within the app. And all those things can mm -hmm. be very useful, especially as you get, you know, in, in, in Apple's AR system, you can have the phone, you know, be your, your wand and the iPad could be your, your virtual camera. There's a lot of yeah. things you can do, I think, within the app that could be simple. I also imagine that all of the, you know, that mid journey or that AI, sorry, you know, I call it sort of the AI text prompt, which is like, give me wood, give me a shape. Mm -hmm. um, voice to input on iPad and iPhone is going to drive That'd that. Be that cool. will be one of the main things <laughs> that gives you a material or texture. Click on this object and while you're holding on the microphone thing, I'd like the wood surface on there and make it shiny. And you'll get back material that is basically an AI prompt generated one from there. So that'll help, um, I think, yeah. for, for new users. Computer. And, uh, and we'll, we'll see if you know. Earl Grey hot <laughs> geometry. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I think that, you know, for, for, for the iPad, it's, it's a whole new market. There's obviously, and the iPhone is even, it's even more so. I mean, I think that we just have to think about a, a new interface. But the fact that these iPhones and iPads are so powerful that they can load essentially or match what a you know, low end desktop GPU can do is, is important because you, you will, you, you know, you're, if you want to expand the audience, which, you know, motion graphics to a whole new audience. I do think mm -hmm. that the complexity needs to go down, but the power, compute power locally is pretty high. I mean, those iPads with 16 gigs of VRAM are pretty good. They can load a yeah. lot of production scenes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can't ignore that. So we just need to think about simple ways of those things working. Plus, between AI prompts, between the render network being up and running, which is a big part of why that, you know, the, the logo for the iPad app is the render network logo because it's meant to be free until you use the render, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think um, we can monetize even a free version of, the, of, of Octane on iPad, iPhone, heck, even on Mac, which is, you know, this, this app is totally free to use. You can do, you know, local rendering with it, but if you want to, you know, get a final render, pay to get it done in the render network. And that's, I right. think, a, an interesting mm -hmm. model that we have to sort of follow and explore further. And is there still, uh, it's still in beta to be a node on render network, right? That's still kind of... It is. 
It is. I, I, so I should speak about the, you know, the, the entire back end because we have, so we have about a million GPUs on the wait list, which is plenty. And, you know, we have under 10% utilization of what we already have going at any, you know, at any one time. And I think the reason why it's low is that we've, we have we know, and I think anybody that's a node operator or even a user knows that the Orbex exporter is, it's a pain point for support. That yeah. like if something goes <laughs> wrong, we have to manually fix it. And we can't do that. And, and here's the thing, we, we, if we were to push every Octane user, and we have plenty of people that are Octane subscribers, even more now since Black Friday. So if we were to just get every, heck, half of all the people that have an Octane sub to use Render, we'd be in a whole different order of magnitude from where we are today. Mm -hmm. And we haven't pushed that because I think for us, the thing that makes the most sense is we want to get the Orbex exporter to be perfect, where it can be, it's nearly there, but also get C4D integration, right? I mean, that license to Maxwell, which we announced a year ago, we just now have working. So if you want to load a C4D file, and I think we'll extend that also to Blender and, and Unreal since we have the libraries for both, um, that'll make things simpler. And I think then we can push a lot more people to utilize the render network. So that mm -hmm. waitlist can then open up and we have no problem with supplying more cheap GPU power. Um, so I think that, that for people that are looking to be node operators, there's that. There's also the fact that AI drops, even simple ones for doing a texture or generating a material, those will run on the render network as well. Um, we're also gonna open up, if you want, want to run stable diffusion in a browser or even embed that into your own web app, we'll be able to give you an API key that does that on the render network as well. So that may just drive usage to a whole other level. Mm -hmm. uh, just looking at, you know, how those things are, are applied on, on, on AWS and others. So I think that, that that's where the future of utilization goes on, on render, and that's gonna go up significantly next year, just with AI drop and just with the simplicity on the art pipeline side going forward. I think if you have a 3090 or 4090, you're gonna be in especially good shape. You don't need a lot of those to be competitive. And I think the new model that we're looking at that's being voted on, um, which I'll maybe a little bit about how render itself is changing this year versus how it's been done in the past. Yeah, we're setting up an independent up, foundation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so render, you know, in order to be fully decentralized, I mean, it's been, there's been a separate entity that Otoys created years ago, 2017, to, to run render. Um, we're moving that entirely into a hands-off foundation. I will not be in that foundation. I will certainly have a vote in how it runs because, you know, Otoy does own render tokens, but that foundation exists to have a totally independent entity run the network um, and Otoy will supply technology to it, but the foundation itself will have votes on the new token economic model, for example, people can propose it. Vote, those votes are actually starting already. And the way it's looking is there is a new system that will be essentially burn and mint model, which means that, you know, it, it means that if you're holding render tokens, there's a way for you to get value out of it just by staking it or holding it. Node operators and node users will be able to get sort of a more definitive, you know, non less volatile way of paying for render, you know, render work, render option bench work. Um, and I think that model will be pretty great. We're also, you know, there's a lot of questions about Solana. I think, you know, right now we're multi-chain. We support Polygon, we support ETH. I think we'll certainly add Solana. And we're going to probably do that as a vote. So, the, you know, the foundation, you know, the group, the community will vote on it. And I do think that Solana, there's nothing that beats it as far as transaction times and its speed and its utility. So I, I, I feel like it's got a lot of great potential, especially for NFTs that need to have those quick transactions. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we'll take our time getting there. And in the meantime, the foundation is a huge step forward. I think the utility um, and, the, and this, essentially the demand that will be driven, I think will also just radically change the lives of node operators and allow us to also onboard a lot more people. Uh, and that local render node that you might be adding for your own you know, mini you know, render network locally, I think will make it much easier for that to be flipped over to a render network node on the public cloud or on the you know, decentralized network. And that will include, by the way, iPads, um, Apple TVs down the line. There's um, the server piece is built into the same piece that is in the client. Uh, we just haven't flipped that switch on yet. And that's going to be really interesting. We, we're, we're trying to figure that out. Obviously, if you let your iPad run overnight, what happens when it's running in the background? Um, you know, obviously with Apple, they've been they've been great proponents of promoting our work, our apps for years. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're sort of working with those teams just on the engineering side of what does it mean to run something in the background? I mean, even while we're rendering, right? You know, if you're if you're running a long render and you're you know, you're, you know toggling the app on the iPad in the background, can we still render? How do we retain that? If that works, we can kind of do full offline renders for the render network as well. And I think that's where, you know, millions of, of even if you have like you know thirty acting bench, where you have you know ten million of these Apple devices, that's a lot of of compute power we we could be adding, um, mm -hmm. you know, to the uh, to the render network. And I think a lot of people will get on board when they f find out how easy it is. Um, the, uh, and, and it is easy and when I do easy scenes I I use it and 
my biggest uh, my biggest pain point for not using Render Network personally is when I have a gigantic scene. And now some of it is because I am in Cinema 4D. That's number one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so there could be plugins, you know, all, all sorts of stuff. And I package my stuff up. The problem comes when I'm like getting over ambitious with my scene and I have a 200 gig VDB file over here and then I've got mm-hmm. like 50 gig of textures. It's like, wow, that Orbix file is just going to be, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. it's going to fill a whole hard drive, you know? So I guess bandwidth is again, the, maybe the pitch pinch point in that situation. But, um, there's been some scenes yeah. that, that have been in, extremely heavy for me to render that have been simple that I've sent over to render. And it's just like, they mm-hmm. just come back so quick. Um, yeah, my favorite just, part of sending a render scene is seeing all the nodes just line yeah. up as it's going. It's you like, see, wow, yeah. that's, that's incredible. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I mean, what, one of the ways to sort of mitigate that would be to have it so that if you're, let's say you're using Pyro and C4D, but we have the entire C4D engine on render mm. to generate those EDBs live, right? Yes. That was kind of the initial idea also with Ember Gen was that we wanted to have the ability to generate things live. And so we'll, we're still, I mean, Ember Gen on the render network will still run as a module, but the idea of having C4D itself there is that anything, you know, and it's not baking out in Orbex, anything that's procedurally generated, including those pyro simulations, we could generate it live where, where you won't have to send those VDBs over. So in those cases, yeah or things that we can generate a VDB with Embergen, for example, you know, that's that's one of the things that I've always known, that vectorization, that procedurality is something that could really make a big difference. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if you have a flat giant texture or a flat giant mesh, you know, there's only so much we could do there, although there is, are, there is mesh compression, which we're looking at. If you're, the, probably the future of Orbex uh, exporting, it will use USD, which has Draco compression for meshes, which is helpful. Um, but I, but I think that you know having C4D itself as a as a you know literally as a as a live engine that can run and process the scene um, means that it can maybe simplify things a lot. And and the you know, great thing we have with Maxon is we can load plugins. Obviously, that's how we can load different renderers. Mm-hmm. We could get other plugins as well. I mean, I, I know that probably probably X particles would be helpful. But I do think that Pyro uh, is an area where it's like if you can do your sims in Pyro and those can be generated on at runtime while you're rendering your frame, that might make a big difference and that might yeah. simplify a lot of um, complexity. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna ask how do you handle uh, how how will plugins be handled like with TFD for example or mm. X particles for example, you know, like would would I'm I'm assuming y'all would have to get license for it, correct? Yep. We, we, we actually could get a license to TFD. I've talked to Josh said about it. Um, we're, you know, it just, it's just one of the things where I'm almost, you know, as we're looking at it, it's like, well, let's just see how this works with, um, with Pyro, right? Because mm-hmm. I mean, Pyro itself is, is obviously, we're, 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 and we are licensed the latest version of C4D, which will have that in there mm-hmm. uh, in 2023 and later. So it's just a question of simplification, but we have to license each of the plugins individually and they have to be rebuilt essentially to run on the render network, which is not the same as a render farm, right? It's got to run on your machine, an average machine. And we've done that with, with Arnold, we've done that with Redshift and with Maxon itself, and of course with Octane. And we, we, we have that lined up for TFD. If there's other plugins, obviously I think X particles would be another one that we should look at. We could do that as well. And probably also just getting Houdini Engine would make sense. Like that's something that's, that Houdini mm-hmm. has a license for this stuff, which we could leverage and, and use. So those are those are the ones that are in the mix. Also, just getting support for Blender and Unreal files directly on the Render Network. Again, plugins notwithstanding, um, that would make a lot of sense as well. Uh, and I think that in, in the Orbex exporter, being able to just you know be smarter and and more reliable as far as what the, the kinds of things we could do would would make sense. Weirdly enough, though, the way that the um, engine integration with with Maxon works and even with Blender and Unreal is we could put a Blender or C3 file in an Orbex and it would run. And you know, an Orbex would contain an FBX or USD. So there are, there are those capabilities in there. Um, we'll see sort of what makes the most sense. Although with, with Delta syncing, again, unless if things are sort of loose files around a C4D file, we can then sort of sync those live. Mm-hmm. And if you have a giant texture, you wouldn't have to upload that twice, which would be nice. Whether it's an Orbex or C4D or anything else, that texture mm-hmm. is hashed. It's almost like it's on IPFS. It'll never right. have to be sent again to the render network. Um, once it once it's uploaded once, right? Mm. And uh, Mike in the chat, you know, just basically reiterating on that because like things like hair, like animated hair in Cinema 4D, that would be great yeah. too. You know, instead of having to like, I, like I essentially it. bake it, you know. 
Yeah. Yeah. I had I've had issues in the past with like TFD exporting that to Orbix, and uh, I sometimes I like at a at, at a point I'd like have it turn on at a certain point. You know, oh, yeah. and it wouldn't yeah. it wouldn't follow that it you know when exporting out to an Orbix. So I'd have to render some yeah. on the render network and then some locally as well. Or you, you could know? convert the VCF to VDB, bring it into VDB loader, and that that's might work what better. I yeah yeah yeah. yeah. But, anyway, um, <laughs> another question. <laughs> oh, go ahead. We, we, yeah, we we could bring TF, we could bring TFD into um into render if, if that's something people want. We weren't mm -hmm. sure, honestly, and we were talking to Josh yeah. about it because we could. It's just work, it's time, and everything. We could do it. He's totally open to it, I think. And and it's just a question: is is this useful now? Is this where we should be focusing our time? Yeah. Or could we depend on since we're starting with a Pyro version? Is that enough? And that's the thing is we want to be careful about over investing in certain complexifiers, right? And that was my thought as well. Goals. I I mean, I'm curious yeah. about the the future of TFD. You know, especially if with Maxon just you know basically bringing it in natively right. you know yeah. so yeah <clears throat> yeah i, I could see x particles being an interesting yeah. one you know because yeah. i yeah. use x particles all the time yeah yeah i think that, that the plugins i mean houdini it, itself just having able to run the houdini simulation on render as you're rendering is important so houdini engine makes tons of sense Mm -hmm. And Blender and Unreal make tons of sense. X Particles makes a lot of sense just to add that onto C4D. Um, as far as the renders go, I mean, I think between you know Octane, Arnold, and Redshift, uh, we're in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there's always you know, and Unreal. Uh, you know, so I think that there's 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 more we could add. So if there's a feature request list of plugins, of tools, of things like that beyond what, what is exported in Orbex file, just let us know. Like I, I think we're looking to get feedback on what people will want. But I just think that what we yeah. already have ready to go and, and on our plate, I think is, is already a pretty good um, starting point for, um, you know, for, for improving the, the current system, which is just Orbex mm -hmm. only, right? Yeah. A couple more yeah. questions here in the chat. Um, one of them was about meshlets. Um, will it work with a simple Octane object tag on Geo or, or is it going to be a, its own object? How, how does that work? I think the, I think it's to be determined. The idea is that it, from you know, cause I'm, you're probably thinking from the C4D system, it'll probably just be a tag. It'll convert this to meshlets, and that means that it'll have to be in a sense frozen, um, and you won't be able, you know. But but it'll it'll be a one-click type of thing, and it'll it'll pre-calculate a bunch of stuff because it does need to sort of repackage that in a format that is ready to stream, so that it's you know on disk it's cached and it's like you can just pull that, you can do a pointer and pull it in. But that's it. I mean, it's essentially a one a one step kind of thing, and it's a little bit like I guess the texture caching system, um, where you can you know I don't know how often that's used and it varies by plugin, but you can essentially you know, compress textures to GPU compressed texture formats, and there is a texture GPU texture cache. We'll have a, a meshlet you know asset cache as well, and so if you there will be a simple tag, I guess in C4D being the object tag that you'll be able to click, and I I would I don't I don't know what will happen if it's an animated you know piece you know what, what might happen or make throw a warning or something but otherwise it'll be something simple like that mm -hmm. and uh and that's that's the idea so that if you make modifications to it it can it can recache it or rebuild it same thing with textures so that's that's a, that's the idea currently we're um you know we're, we're definitely going to have it so that it, once you once you create that cache version of a method it is sort of stored so you don't have to do it you can click it on or off it'll save the cache for a while um but you know it won't be complicated it's not meant to be anything com more complicated than a simple checkbox to enable an asset to be, you know, streamable versus loadable or, or in memory, for example. And all, and also the question about the uh, like about lidar point cloud stuff. Um, is there work going on with point cloud rendering directly, or is that going to integrate into something else that's coming, like some of the? Uh... Well, I th oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, th I think that the um, the situation about, about point clouds is that yes, there is there is. Um, I think that we should we should figure out whether or not the meshless stuff would work with that because the meshless stuff mm -hmm. is, is works with textures, it works with geometry, but you can also it's working with vertices, right? So the point is your points are, are just vertices. The point cloud is a vertex file. And there's also a lot of compression. It depends on whether it's sparse, a sparse point cloud or a dense one. If it's a dense point cloud, there's actually tons of, of compression systems, including I mean NVIDIA just put out something called Neural VDB, right? Which allows you to do some really interesting stuff there. And I do think that that there's also, I mean, nerfs for things that are right. that are point cloud like are really mm -hmm. interesting. Those are nerfs are pretty well compressed. I mean, it's using a neural network to compress the data, 
So there's going to be tons of options for loading, you know, compressed volumetric point cloud type scenes. And there's also going to be a direct point cloud renderer. Like we have something that already allows you to sort of just blast, like, you know, 80 billion, you know, points from a, you know, from a file into the scene. Uh, it's, it's just sort of early, but we're using that by the way to, um, uh, to render a star field. Uh, you know, there's like this massive data set that's 80, I think it's about, you know, 80 gigs or whatever, which doesn't fit in memory that is just, you know, every star that you can, that's been collected by all the different observatories. And I want to have the procedural space in Starfield system. We put a Starfield shader in 2022, but if you guys remember in Noctane 4, we had the planetary environment. I want to have a full universe simulator with, uh, <laughs> you know, you generate a black hole, gravity, all of it. I mean, it's not that hard. It's like the laws of physics and light extending octane towards things that are sort of cosmic or stellar, uh, not, not a big deal, but that is definitely one of the things <clears> I want to be able to support. Um, NASA is actually one of the big users of the render network, or at least I hired a team that, that uses it. So I'm like, yeah, we want to have physically correct space environments, terrain environments, the stuff with World Creator. I think we're just beginning on that integration. I mean, right now there's a limited version that exports to Orbex, but the idea is that it can do live linking. And that's another area where that headless rendering piece allows you not just to send your Octane GPU work to another node, like you can have Cinema and Octane open and they can both share that scene and one can be changing, instead of having an Orbex proxy, you can see what Blender's doing, you can see what, what SketchUp's doing. Mm -hmm. And that kind of interoperability is really fascinating as well. So we want to build on those, on those systems and allow you to create extensions for all these different um, you know, features and, and, and sort of hub um, live linked uh, you know, ecosystem plays for, for artists. And World Creator could definitely fit into that. Um, and, mm -hmm. and Moe as well for modeling. The uh, light linking is coming as well, right? There's some uh, light linking updates in 23, I think. Yes. <clears throat> so th I think the biggest change with lights in 2023 is you'll be able to finally do, um, uh, you know, lighting plus beauty passes. You have to, you'd, you'd almost do either or. You could do your lighting passes or beauty passes. You couldn't mix those together. And even worse, you couldn't denoise them separately. So you'll be able to denoise those individual light passes. Yeah. You'll be able to mix and match lighting and beauty passes. And then on light linking, we're just, you know, we're at least going to expand it beyond the eight that's there now, but we're kind of looking to just completely fix how that works and just get that working right, along with all the other changes that are going underneath um, the hood for, you know, for, for the lights in general. That is like one of the number one requested features was fixed light linking. So that is our number one <laughs> feature yeah. um, on top of all the other lighting work that's been done in Octane. And I think it, it's almost going to be done in three parts, which is, you know, denoising for lighting, uh, mixing and matching beauty and lighting passes, in, in, expanding light linking so that it has no hard limits, essentially, um, mm -hmm. or at least the limits are, are, are known to artists. And, uh, and then I think that'll also come in line with some of the other lighting work that we're showing in that video, which is those fast one sample per pixel spotlights, a single spot, a single light node that is identical to Arnold's where you have the drop down for sphere, disc, you know, all of that mm -hmm. stuff, spotlight and, and a spread function, right? And people, like, people hate the idea of a spread function node that gets added into the mesh. I mean, that's, it's, it's just because Octane's been this way for, you know, 12 years. It's, it's always had mesh lights. Even if we improve the way that those spotlights and quad lights work, they haven't been analytic you know, procedural lights, they are in 2023, finally. So we can do that. We can have, you know, finally directional lights, you know, have eight of them or whatever um, that act like just, this, you know, like the sunlight. And that I think is a big improvement where lights in general will be simpler, easier and more powerful and render almost instantaneously, at least for direct lighting, um, you know, in 2023 going forward. So light linking mm -hmm. gets fixed along with all yeah. of the other, all the other pieces. Rest position as well for Houdini. I know that was a big feature. We tried to get it in 2022, didn't make it. It's going to be in 2023. Um, yeah, there's a lot. That that list of features in 23 is is pretty, pretty big. But mm -hmm. I think it covers. Yeah, you know, if there's things we're missing, you know, again on the on the on the MoGraph Slack where there's you know 700 yeah. great artists that are giving us feedback, please provide us feedback there. And then of course we'll have the 2023 beta, which will start with pretty much what's shown in those videos will be what we'll begin with. Um, and then, you know, we're looking to get feedback on, on, on sort of, you know, that's why it's a closed beta. We want to make sure that even when we put out a very first public XB release, it's got at least a few hundred artists eyes on it, giving us some mm -hmm. feedback and helping us get it in a right, the right place before we lock things in and, you know, and get it closer to final release stage, you know, in Q1 and Q2. Yeah. I love, oh. I love the light, uh, linking stuff that's in there and being able to exclude lights and stuff, you know, and all that. And the, the, the conversation Matt and I were having this morning before the show was about like, now it's like just a matter of like, I got to remember what this light was set to, yeah, you know, or, or there's a light over here and I don't know why it's, 
it's not I, doing this. I'm like, oh, I got to go find that light and figure out what it's assigned I, to number wise. I, I love to label it, and you know, I love the way Arnold does lights in C4D, where you just go into your project tab and you can include or exclude, you know, and just drop in your lights. Like mm. that's fantastic. I think the ID, the ID workflow. Once you once you get a good workflow, no, it it's sucks. fine. But yeah, it's it's, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's I it's prefer it to be so. Bit. The, 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 the thing that you're missing in there is trace sets. Trace sets are something that Arnold has had for a while, which is you create a group and you name it, mm-hmm. and it's not a number. And then you can refer to that name to include and exclude anything, whether it's rounded edges, whether it's um, yeah. you know even the Boolean operations, which mm-hmm. we, we I think Arnold was the first to have those. I mean, we brought it off the GPU. But I think that that's where you know, being able to include and exclude you know, groups of lights that are in trace sets makes a lot more sense than an, than an ID. So, I mean, I think that we're going to certainly improve the current system then add trace sets, but I do think that's the goal is we end up with trace sets at the end of it, so I think solve all these different problems pretty comprehensively. I noticed somebody's asking about volumetric skies and clouds. So what's mm-hmm. interesting is World Creator does create a great job of that, and one of the goals we have is to just bring all the World Creator procedural nodes directly into Octane. So you don't even have to have a separate mm-hmm. World Creator app. You just have what's in the World Creator for Octane thing, which everyone gets, right? That's, that's and even monthly subscribers get that. I, the idea is not that that's just so much a separate app, but that it just becomes one of the built-in nodes. Um, you could do that. I mean, there are people that have written OSL sky shaders and things like that. It's it's not that hard, but it needs to be – it's not that easy either. And I get why artists want it, and I want to have a system that can generate the kinds of terrains that you see done with World Creator, right? I mean, Aaron Westwood loves that stuff. I mean, he's actually, I think, in the 2022.1 forums or Facebook groups giving us feedback now, like, improve this for scattering, improve this for, for you know, generating trends. Like, the idea that I want to have Octane essentially generate from, you know, the Big Bang to, you know, essentially, you know, the Earth and, and, and you know, nanoscale, you know, resolution of, of plants and objects. I mean, I, I think having it generate environments naturally and easily, skies included, I mean, I really want that to happen in 2023. It's a lot of that goes into work above the engine, but we have some great partnerships. Um, and I do think the World Creator stuff is just a great tool set. And they're very open. I mean, the idea with, with all of these sort of partner tools is that if we can build them into Octane or build bridges into the core, so you don't have to have a separate app, great. You know, we proved that model out with Sculptron. You can kind of sculpt those objects as, an, as a plugin within, you know, other ECCs or other standalone tools. It's not working, you know, in, in a mass scale. But I do think with World Creator, that might be a great way to, to get a lot of the procedurality that they have. So you don't have to bake to Norbex. You don't have to do live linking. It just works within, you know, a set of uh, World Creator nodes that just goes mm-hmm. into its own little slot in the, in the node or texture slot, right? I mean, that's, that's ultimately what the export, yeah, that's what the or- exporter is doing. And we're that's halfway towards being able to do live linking, which is probably a, you know, two thirds of the way towards doing, um, you know, something where we can integrate it as, as a baked in uh, module and, and node system. Is it similar? Sim- it's similar in what y'all are doing with Embergen, correct? Yeah. So Embergen was. I mean, I, I think that the, the idea initially was to make it a part of the C forty plugin, and I think the way that that Jenga looked at it, and this is why I think we we sort of kept it as a as a as an app, is that they want to have Embergen be experienced as an app. One thing we did get working though pretty well is that we have live linking between the, we had the source code of the app between that and between multi render so you could sort of force load the app change the camera feed to geometry that bridge will, will, will coexist after the the one point release of ember gen and beyond um, but i think that having that be, be something that's directly integrated probably less of a of a priority given that pyro exists mm-hmm. and that changed our, our calculus even for bringing tfd in there i just think that pyro is, is so well integrated in c4d there's no point in trying to like like upend that, but there, there are benefits. I mean, Evergen is unique. There's nothing else quite like it, and we don't, don't want to lose that either, but I also think that for them to, to continue doing what they're doing, this bridging of, um, of being able to sort of live link their stuff and almost use it through multi-render. Now, you can always, of course, save the VDB, load that in just like you can with Pyro, mm-hmm. but there is also something magical about being able to composite the Evergen live rendering piece in there. And with the, and with the integration that we have, we think that should be possible. Uh, we showed a video of that where you were able to essentially generate a live Embergen scene and run it in the viewport. And this is before we have some of the fancier things, but that checkerboard pattern where I was able to sort of really mm-hmm. con- connect those things together. So I think that, that in, in brigade mode, with Embergen running live and with the ability to sort of blend you know, the lighting between the two, you might have something pretty pretty awesome. And and Embergen has its own set of, of unique nodes and pieces that are kind of different from other 
you know, from other tools and other systems. I mean, we'll obviously support that through the through the bridge, um, but that's sort of the trajectory that we're going on with with them. And I think with with Moai 3D as well, like there's um, there's some great hard surface pieces. Like they work in nerves, right? We want to make it so that you can kind of you know take something that is baked into a mesh and reopen and edit that um, within you know the, you know the, the host application. And I think Average will probably mm-hmm. work in, in a similar way, but with with World Creator, we want to try to get it so that the, it's it's almost it's clear enough that I think the nodes themselves that are in World Creator could almost be integrated without a separate UI and still work really well within the CPD plugin. And that's kind of the direction we're, we're most likely heading. And I think with Embergen, you'd still need to have the Embergen UI, their node graph pop up and be open to really edit the things that they're doing and also to, to not limit them to what we're doing in the plugin. So that way we can kind of keep Embergen with their 2.0 version going. The bridge would still work with, within that system. And uh, and yeah, it's uh, and they have liquid gen, they have scenery gen, they've got explosion gen. I think they have a lot of different modules and pieces, all of which we would plug in in the same you know, similar fashion. I have awesome. a question about uh, VDBs, and I feel like you're either going to tell me that this already exists or you're working on it already. <laughs> um, but is uh, what about a way to uh, maybe AI upscale voxels? Um, on something. It's like if you have a VDB oh, yes. that's kind of like junky looking, like I, I loaded up an explosion this week and it looked great, except it was kind of voxel once it got real big. And I either have to recreate it or, you know, find a way to hide it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think upsampling, um, you know, and even Everson does have that, that scaling system, right, where they, they scale up their VDBs. I mean, we, we have that, we have a built-in upscaler in, in Octane that, frankly, doesn't get used a whole lot. We put it in the wrong place. It's in the image node, and it should just be a, a texture node operator. The other thing I should mention that's a huge improvement in 23 is the, the GPU compositor is going to have a full node graph that can load in textures, OSL shaders. You can do anything live in the compositor the same way you can in textures, which is which is huge. That that's where the you know two D sample, upsampler will go. There'll also be a three D upsampler, three D, you know, interpolator, all these different things, right? And I think that yeah. we'll, we'll apply that to VDBs as well. There is for sure an AI VDB upscaler, uh, and and I think that's definitely in the mix. I mean, it's one of those things where it's on our roadmap. Um, I just don't know where it'll fit in with with all the other pieces, but it's definitely. Uh, you know, it's not too hard of an extension for us to build on top of our 2D uh, AI app sampler. Nice. Um, we always ask you about the holodeck. We have to get updates <laughs> on the holodeck every time. <laughs> uh, I, has there been, I know it's been a busy year. Have there been any, oh my gosh, Matt. <laughs> what? What is that? <laughs> my... My my wharf. Well, oh, okay. sm- Smearballs did say we need Klingons. Mm, there right? you go. That's nice. <laughs> um, is there? Um, oh, and and speaking of which, he he also just asked, um, does Otoy have an AI frame interpolation yes. in the works? Yes. Yes, that is hundred percent in the works. I mean, I don't know what that is. Can yeah, you tell me what that is? Yeah. So, <laughs> well, it's it basically it's it's. There's many ways you can, frame interpolation means you render it three frames a second and you get back 240, right? So it can generate oh. 80 subframes or A frames, right? Which is how a lot oh. of the AI video prompts work is that they generate, they generate three or four frames a second. And then there's AI interpolators that can basically give you super smooth interpolation between frames, you know, one. So you know, similar zero, to like a Twixter you know, zero, or thing. Or Absinthe. Absinthe, yeah. maybe. Yeah, EBC. and it works yeah. exactly. And those things work really well. So we are, we, we we have pieces for those as well that, that are. I mean, anything that's in the, that's in sort of the AI upsampling or temporal upsampling thing is absolutely in the works. Um, it's <clears throat> and to be honest, I think it'll probably end up being built into stable diffusion as well because if you use stable diffusion locally or offline or online, it'll have those pieces. Like they even have image to depth generation that was a separate hugging face module that we used to plug in on top of stable diffusion 1.5. So no, AI frame interpolation is huge. Um, and I was gonna say that that's, you, you can absolutely expect that to ship within um, 2023.1. Uh, and there'll also be, uh, t- you know, essentially what we used to call time warping in VR, where we, we, you know, for brigade mode, you'll be able to just interpolate missing frames. So if you're running a, a monitor that can run 144 frames a second, it'll take the depth channel and it'll ch- take the history of the frames you had before, and it'll make it work at 144 frames a second nicely. That's no, it's actually not a big d- delta over doing the temporal uh, denoiser that we currently have in brigade uh, in the beta currently. Yeah, and, so, and that's yeah, what Nick's saying in, their, in in the in the chat is that you know the existing interpolators are not they don't have obviously they don't have access to the 3D 
information, mm-hmm. but they would. Motion vectors, input geometry, yep. all of that, and it would be more accurate. That's great. Um, yeah, that's a yep. killer feature. So I think we were, we were talking about the holodeck. Yeah, I mean, it is a killer feature. <laughs> by the way, for the for the you know the simple like the temporal, I, let's call it the temporal denoise, the final version that will do really nice um, smooth interpolations and does have the motion vectors. And similarly, the depth of field effect that's in Brigade right now, it, it's not just a depth map. I mean, it does do ray tracing, same thing, but it, it's using the fact that we have all that information almost pre-calculated to do almost a post-processing effect of, on depth of field. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not completely a Z-buffer, but it is, it's got multiple you know, layers and stuff. So it can, it can do that stuff. And same thing with, with, with being able to interpolate frames. That will not even need an AI filter. When we apply an AI stuff on top of that, it'll be even, who knows, it'll be even crazier. Um, or it'll be able to work from even sparser sets of data. But already the world is moving towards even AI stable diffusion. You get a depth pass, what if you send it a cryptomat pass where everything's really separated and you know, all of that becomes much more interesting. Um, and, and by the way, crypto map passes in the compositor now can be, even in 2022, you can select that, mask it out, use that as a prompt to, you know, to in-painting or out-painting for uh, stable diffusion node, right, in the compositor. And it, it's wild the things you can do. Uh, we're digressing a bit, though, from the holodeck, yeah. which I think is <laughs> where the question was going. So, and if there are other questions, so, um, make sure you get them in the chat here while we're, while we're talking about the holodeck. Yeah, I, I'm good for another like 15, 20 minutes, by the way. So, cool. Okay. <laughs> um, awesome. I don't know if the rest of you guys. So the holodeck is, you know, it's it's all being, you know, pushed forward by our partners at Lightfield Lab, which basically, I think a year ago, or was, I think, my God, the years don't mess with it, but a year ago, they showed the very first public demonstration. Mm-hmm. It was a, mm-hmm. an iguana. Um, I put that in one of my videos recently. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it, we should probably put a link to, to at least my breakpoint talk. And it's amazing. I mean, it's basically showing, I mean, you have to see it with your eyeballs, but if you take a video of it, you move the camera around and you're seeing, you know, the scales of the iguana have this very fine specular relighting, which is, which is wild. Uh, and we are testing it, by the way, with, with Star Trek content. I mean, the work we're doing on the Ronda Baron, probably touch on that a little bit, mm-hmm. is designed to, you know, go full circle and be ex- experienced on Lightfield Labs full scale displays. So LFL is shipping panels this year to location-based entertainment vendors. Um, they're the ones that have the budget and the money to pay for it. I don't know when those mm-hmm. will be live, but those are mm-hmm. out the door and going you know, going out there. And they've, they've raised a lot of money. They're not going anywhere. So they're 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 building this thing. And I would say that you will start to see it probably in, in you know location-based entertainment, whether it's theme parks or concerts or museums, probably by mid-decade, which is not that far off, we're about to hit you know, 2023, right? So I'd say in the next year or two, and I think the, the point where it starts to show up in you know, high-end home theater is like a 100-inch holographic panel will probably be in the five years that follow. And by 2030 or 2032, let's say, just give us 10 years, that's when it'll be probably competitive with you know, the price of an OLED or something. And, and mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's really just comes down to the scale. There's nothing that is going to stop this thing from being as cheap as current displays other than the amount that you're making, right? The, the reason why plasma TVs were expensive is there's too few of them. When you have the mass kind of scale, and this is what's great about LFL, they're licensing this to the Sonys, the LGs, the Samsungs, presumably of the world. I mean, anybody that wants to use it, like people integrate Dolby color or lighting or sound, right? Um, you know, it's going to be like that. And so when there's, you know, when there's hundreds of millions of holographic panels being made, they'll be cheap. Currently, to drive one of those 20 inch by 20 inch LFL panels, you need about 15, 86 thousands, the old kind. <laughs> You'll now need Gosh. probably closer to, you know, seven or eight 40 90s, which is already an improvement. But you can imagine <laughs> by the time you get to the, uh, whatever, the 60 90s or 70 90s or something like that, we'll be yeah. down to one. And that'll be baked into the back of the LFL panel. And then you can then link those panels together in a video wall and you're done. And, and essentially that's where, you know, and, and so if you imagine you're, you know, three generations out, that's probably, Towards the you know 2027 or something, you'll be able to have probably one GPU per LFL panel, uh, and that's going to be pretty remarkable. Um, wow. the, the holodeck itself, of course, is still going to be a lot of those panels. I mean, it's I think we did the calculations where it's tens of millions of dollars of LFL panels if we were to build it today, and probably the power of the GPUs. If you think about the number of A6000s, would be Gosh. way more than that. So it's it's, it's can, a bit tough. I can only imagine to build. the heat. I know. How hot yeah, it's, that it's, would be. It's like, I mean, you would probably need the real Starship Enterprise just to host the holiday. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. I think that, I, you need your own warp drive. I think that... <laughs> I think I think that the holodeck itself is an experience. Some sometime in the next five or six years is not is not unreasonable given the GPUs 
And probably if LFL has enough resources, they could probably build custom ASICs that could do that as well. But we have the, the, the pre-computed path, which is what renders for. Like you, if you just want to create a, you know, 100K by 100K image, which is what the ray of bundles are for, I think, one of their panels, or it's per square meter, right? You, you can do that and you can play blast that and, and you will get back a holographic linear linear experience. It'll be viewable from any any angle. If you want something that's in real time, that's where the brigade stuff comes in. That's where we need essentially one GPU per panel and the 790, you know, 7090 or whatever the equivalent of that is will probably cover cover that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, we'll be off to the races. We'll be able to do live holographic streaming. It'll work really well. And I think that by the time that, you know, on the content side, you know, we're working on this, on the Gene Ronnebury archive, build, rebuilding the enterprise. You know, the it looks most amazing. One, all done it in C4D so crafting. Good. It looks amazing, right? Yeah. And there's some crazy stuff. Like, you know, this year, you know, we started to bring in characters. We brought in Yeoman Colt from the, the Cage, the pilot episode. Um, the last video, we, 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 we sort of added one more character, which was Spock, and, and we did this incredible prosthetics work with him and so digital. So good. Like, we did digital eyes, digital yeah. teeth. Um, and, and it was those tools that we used. I mean, we did a lot of work learning about virtual production, and we dogfooded that. And I expect all those tools to become available in Octane 2023 subs. At some point, like we did a lot of stuff with AI. Uh, market tracking, facial tracking, and those are things that we want to commoditize and put into the into the subs, so that you can bring in, you know, you can do live sort of skeletal tracking, bring that into Cascade, or do some sort of motion tracking with the light stage scans, which are another piece that we had. We have body scans now that we brought into the um, mm -hmm. uh, into the asset packs that we're putting out there, and we want a configurator, so you can you know build your avatar, your assets at super high quality, you know, take the face and then essentially run a video feed from your iPad or your your you know your iPhone even and generate you know beautiful um, art with that. We did some of those pieces. We tested some of those pieces with that Roddenberry content. But yeah, the, the path there is we tell all the Star Trek history. We've gotten you know about, I don't know, 20 different bridges created. So there's a time lapse in the last video we made where it goes from the cage to all the way to the Enterprise E, and they just showed the Enterprise F that's going into Picard season three. Um, we have built all the interactive layers in Unreal, so you actually have this interactive experience that's a, that goes on top of the Orbex file, similar to what we did with the Beeple interactive piece. Mm -hmm. And we picked Unreal because Unreal is open source. They've given us this very permissive library, so we can build mm -hmm. this you know, interactivity node, we can drop it in an Orbex package, and it can just drive the user interface, it can drive the interactive interactivity, and that's wonderful, but it's beautiful. Um, it's beautifully done. It's all, all these shots were, the CG shots were rendered on the render network, by the way, not just in Octane, which is pretty cool. So, you know, tier two nodes or tier three nodes were responsible for rendering all of the video, all those images. And uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty crazy. What is the ultimate goal with the Roddenberry archive? Because I've seen so much so of this we... and like, you know, doing <laughs> the, the, you know the star trek the the motion picture stuff you know on render and yep. what what's the ultimate goal the ultimate goal is to have a, you know you have something that's a lot like wikipedia for star trek called memory alpha it's basically mm -hmm. a w wikipedia page that's got 50,000 entries and it tells you everything that happened in the world of star trek almost in wikipedia form the, the goal of the Ronnie Archive was twofold. It's like that exists, but it's not necessarily visual. So we want the visual history of Star Trek, all of the different episodes, for you to be able to go in those episodes, even the cartoon. Like this, you know, we did a shot from the animated series and brought it back to life. So you can take something hmm. that was the cell animated piece or something from the novels or something from Gene's scripts. And that's yeah. the thing is we have millions of pages of documents from Gene Ronnie ar collective archive that are from, you know, versions of Star Trek that were halfway to production um you know yeah you know, some some scripts where kirk is replaced for pike the idea is that we we have almost like in the very last episode of star trek enterprise which was the beginning of my last great point talk there there was this controversial scene where you know because star trek went off the air for like 10 years from tv at that point where the very last episode it turns out that everything you've just been seeing of, of the original enterprise is a holodeck simulation on you know, an Enterprise 20 years in the future, and Riker's like, you know, end scene or whatever, you know, and, and he walks out of the, you know, the holodeck room, and you're like, wait a minute, it's everything that I've just seen, it's the entire history of the original Star Trek Enterprise, just a holodeck simulation. Ultimately, that's an interesting, you know, meta question, but the idea of the Ryan mm -hmm. Archive is you can do the same thing. You can go 500 years in the future from where Picard season three ends off, and there's a bigger Enterprise that is simulating all of the other Enterprises before it in the holodeck simulation, and we provide that on a real-life holodeck, and yeah. we come up with a way where you have that ability. Now, whether we ever get there, I think the way that it'll work is it'll end up being some sort of DAO where we let people actually add to the Archive, because we've hired so many people 
like, hey, you want to work on the, the ring ship enterprise? I mean, it almost feels like we're, we're almost this collective at this point. We only have about I don't know, 15 to 20 core artists, but we have a lot more that are contributing to these different pieces. And that model feels like a little bit like the render the metaverse contest from, from years back. Like I kind of feel mm -hmm. like we might actually get all of Star Trek history done. Um, and I do think that the hard parts, which are the movies and the episodes, especially the classic ones from Roddenberry, you know, we are working on, on meticulously getting, you know, actors to portray those things. So we have, you know, volumetric captures, of mm -hmm. you know, actors that look like those that have sound alikes and the like on set. And it started with the cage with the director of the cage, Robert Butler, who was alive, you know, 60 years later, mm -hmm. redirecting those shots with it was, it was the most surreal thing. So, you know, we, we have that as a basis going forward and we'll see how far we get. But it's an ambitious project. It's meant to be the visual living holographic museum of the story of Star Trek and, and more importantly, Gene Roddenberry, who did things beyond Star Trek, including his own offshoots, other things he created, his collaborations and ideas with Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, you know, others, of, other contemporaries, which are fascinating. So it's great stuff there. So uh, I say we've got another, you know, 20 years of hard work on this. Um, some of the earliest work going in the archive was done by Rod, myself, and an artist at Otway, going back almost, I think, 21 years. So it's really, wow. it's been a long time in development. Yeah. Yeah, done in Lightwave uh, Octane for, for, you know, Lightwave took over, I think, in uh, 2011, but it was done mm -hmm. purely in Lightwave back in the, back in the 2000, 2001 uh, time frame. Well, it's going to be so meta when you can go in the holodeck, <laughs> in the holodeck. Like, <laughs> it's... Yeah, yeah. The hardest part, though, is going to be, be like the... a Moriarty situation. We're going to yeah. be stuck. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's, he's back in Picard season three, by the way, right? So oh! <laughs> yeah, they showed that in the preview. Uh, it's, I mean, so, you know, we, we put out these these updates on, on the, the Ron Cup like two or three times a year. We're definitely going to do one, I think, around the time that Picard season three starts or ends, because there's such it's there's such callbacks to the history of Star Trek. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have built all of the Enterprise D sets and the C and the B and everything and, and, and the E. So, you know, there's, there's, and the folks that worked on the F for like friends, you know, which is one of the new ships they show on the show. So the idea of having all the enterprises and all the history of that stuff in there in some form is, is definitely on the, on the cards. And also the interviews, the behind the scenes interviews that we're doing with the cast and the crew, mm -hmm. big part of that, there's a whole documentary portion to it as well. Mm -hmm. And all of this, everything we do gets recorded on, on chain, on render, so that if you, you know, forgetting the NFT side of things, there's just a, a record of who created what, both in the art that we're doing, but also relative to the art that came before it. Like, is this from Douglas Trumbull's work? Is this from Sid Mead's work? Um, you know, is this from Gene's version of the script or, or you know, Justin's? And all these, these things are a template for others to be able to create good provenance and attributes for other types of work and IP alongside it. I look at, at the Ronda America as a great, you know, template for how IP can be handled in a post-metaverse future, you know, on chain. Is this, is, is the Roddenberry ar Archive like kind of a big passion project for you oh it's it's super much it's a super passion project for me it's very personal you know it's like i, I consider you know you know gene and angel and roddy like family you know it's like i i grew up literally in that house i also think that the philosophy of star trek is something that speaks enormously to me when people talk Same. about the dystopian possibilities yeah. of ai and everything else I'm like well listen gene created a future where you know, Russia and, you know, Chekhov is part of the enterprise where everyone gets along. We've got, we've got, we, we, we're post-scarcity. And, you know, and yet there's still a future where like with all these other things with AI and, and with, with, you know, no money, there's a beautiful thing about, you know, trying to advance humanity. And Gene really did hit on that in, you know, in the seventies with, with his novel, the motion picture novel starts off with, you know, sort of really saying, well, there's these new humans, they live in the equivalent of the metaverse in a VR world. He talks about that. And Kirk, you know, and, and, and speaking through Kirk, he says, well, everyone that isn't that goes on this shift, risks their lives, and that's how humanity expands. We don't live in an echo chamber of a virtual simulation. And Gene mm -hmm. wrote this like in 79. And this is something that I think is applicable today. Like we need to keep expanding our horizons outside of whatever virtual worlds we create and think of a better future. And that is, you know, an optimistic and plausible and realistic views. So that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about it. It's not something I see in a lot of other large swaths of, of science fiction. Um, so it, it means a lot to me. And I do think that, you know, my love of Star Trek, I mean, I love Marvel and DC and Star Wars, mm -hmm. too. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's the Alex Ross archive yeah. and, and all that. <laughs> but I just feel like the, the Ron Rackham just has his own momentum. Rod's an investor in Otoy, so that's how we got the endowment started, right, to get mm -hmm. this going. And, I, you know, when we started putting putting these pieces out, the, the reaction to it was so strong. 
Um, even with CBS, even with Apple putting it in their keynote twice, we're like, well, this is something that people value on its own merits. It's not a commercial project. Um, it's a little bit like the Smithsonian exhibit of, of the original right. enterprise right. that they have yeah. there. Uh, I look at it in that in that respect. It has a huge, you know, you know, utility. It's something I care about personally, and it's something that I think people react positively to. So, yeah, I feel like there's every, every, there's a million and one reasons to keep doing it, um, mm-hmm. and 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 learn from it. I mean, I think we're also learning a lot about how, you know, how our own pipelines can work, and also how content and preservation works in a future that is, you know, very fast uh, and quickly evolving. I love that. I love that. I'm I'm so glad you're doing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a I'm a huge Star Trek fan, as you know. You know, we have talked extensively about Star yeah. Trek. You know, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's amazing. I think the hardest part it's about uh, you know the future and the holodeck, you know, is going to be getting those getting those eighty nineties to put it on. <laughs> you know, and you're still going to yeah. be waiting in line at Best Buy. You know, right? <laughs> I still won't have them. Well, you know, I, I, it's funny. I mean, Jensen's, like, Jensen's apparently a huge star. I mean, so we get people in the industry saying we love the Ryan America. You know, Epic loves it because we use Unreal for a lot of it. And, mm-hmm. and of course, Apple's put it in a couple of keynotes. And Jensen as well is like, you know, I'm a huge Star Trek fan and everything. So, you know, and I I know Jensen and those NVIDIA guys super well. Richard Karras, who runs Omniverse, is on our board of advisors. So it's like there's – I think it's a great project to sh- sort of showcase. It's like, well, if you're thinking about something in the metaverse that could be a beautiful, awesome, you know – gold standard for how you'd want to have something you know created i mean this this i think could also reflect that and you're getting a lot of buy-in on that so we'll see i mean it's an organic process you know every year has been a learning experience but we're just going to keep going and and take it from there also awesome that's so great anything (laughs) else uh i feel like we've covered so much i i don't know if we've have we missed anything i'm looking at my notes i know i've covered everything i i wanted to to hit on here. I think we so. have. I think there's, cool. we talked a little bit earlier, we, how about Solana, right? How we, we, we think that, you know, I do think Solana is a great chain. I mean, there's been questions to whether we're going to still adopt it. There's been a lot of sort of, you know, consternation around the, the crypto mm-hmm. space recently with the FTX stuff, which is, yeah. you know, huge nightmare. Yes, yes, terrible. Um, you know, I, I keep re- retweeting people's, you know, art because I think it's speaks. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's nothing else I can say. But, you know, thank, thank goodness it doesn't, affect, it doesn't affect render. But I think that, you know, it also really fun, doesn't change any of the fundamentals with Solana being super fast, super useful. And so that's why I think the value of Solana from a tech perspective is there. And we're still, you know, heavily, you know, invested in, in figuring out how that can help render. So mm-hmm. I wanted to sort of add that. I think that's a question I get a lot out there. Probably worth yeah. mentioning it. Yeah. The tech is yeah. there, but it's just like, you know, this, this FTX incident doesn't, doesn't help people's uh i guess understanding of of the yeah. industry in, cha- in general especially those who really don't know much about it you know right 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 yeah well, like i i think i think yeah. if everyone understood render and what it's trying to do you know what it is doing uh the <laughs> the price of render would skyrocket you know <laughs> but like the the thing is like i i get the utility and i right. you know for me personally, I understand the future of it and I see where it's going and I'm a supporter of it, you know, from day one. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I appreciate that. I mean, I see one more question or a couple of questions in here. I can yeah. probably answer. Uh, what's next for prime tier? So I think the biggest thing for prime tier is that pretty much everything on the map will be going into prime tier. Um, there is, there, I mean, you, you kind of already have that stuff in there, but for 2022, at least like we're just going to kind of just, Send everyone to prime things. So most 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 of what you can do on a, um, you know, on a single GPU is is all you can do on a, on, a, on a you know on a map right now. So mm-hmm. there'll be more stuff coming to prime tier on the map side. We might add Lightwave to prime. That's been something people have been asking for. There might be a couple of other plugins, but I mean it's completely free. So there's there's that, and then there might also be a way to use rendered tokens or, or render itself to just cover uh, usage on prime tier or even in, in in the Studio Plus tier. But we'll see. That's that's the um. That's where we're at for, uh, you know, on that tier uh, at the moment. Awesome. 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 Man, we Jules, really... Jules, thank you so much for being yeah. here. Yeah. It's always a pleasure to have you. Like, you're... It's it's the shows that I look forward to every year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We always have Same to... with me. I love being on here. Yeah, we've always got to go back and, and watch it a couple more times at half speed <laughs> to take it all in. Right. And, you know, um, if, if people want to... You know, ask you a question or reach out, um, or if they if they're looking for a place to go 
to do that, maybe not necessarily you direct directly, what are some of the best places for people to go online? I would say the Facebook uh, Octane Render Group, which is like 51,000 people in it, is great. Wow, I answer yeah. as many questions as I can there directly. Um, less so Twitter. I mean, you know, at Otoy, at Jules Verbeck. I mean, I, I, I handle both of those accounts. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit harder to track things on Twitter. But on the Facebook group, I think there's not just me. There's an entire team there. So I right. I will. I would say go there if you're on Facebook, and if you're not, you know, Twitter's not a bad place. The forums, of course, are another. Um, but those would be the areas that I spend the most amount of time. And if you're if you're into render, then itself, uh, there's a Telegram group, uh, which I'm also in. There's about I don't know, that 10, 11,000 people on there. I don't get a chance as much to be you know, participate there, but th those are basically the groups where I'm personally answering questions as much as I can. And uh, the Facebook group is definitely the one where I'm the most active. So I would go there first if if you can. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. awesome. All right. Well, we're going to get out of here. You can uh, rate us on iTunes, leave a review, helps uh, help to get our ratings up there. You can subscribe to our newsletter. Go to MoGraph.com to check out all the information on all the live shows and everything. MoGraph.com slash live. Uh, you can see this the schedule. You can uh, look at the archives, all of that. You can buy a course or two, you know, while you're there. Mm -hmm. And, of course, MoGraph TV. You can watch MoGraph TV 24-7. Look at that. And as soon as this show is over, it'll go to something else. I don't know what's, pl I don't know what's up next <laughs> when we go back to our, our, uh, our local affiliates. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, you could also say you've been there, done that, got the T-shirt with the MoGraph logo T, the Feel the Bab, Paul Bab shirt. All the profits from that go to Doctors Without Borders. The Render Things T-shirt, hoodie, and long sleeve T, the MoGraph blandishment shirt, and the That Render is Fire shirt, which you are only allowed to wear ironically, unless you're Shams. Unless you're Shams, yes. yes. And again, we're on YouTube, MoGraph.com. Check us out on all the things. And uh, again, Jules, thank you so much. Thank we you. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Yeah, As always. stick around here on Skype. We'll we'll chat a little bit after the show. That's when we get to talk about the fun stuff that no one else can hear yet. You yeah, know, just like all the <laughs> secrets, right? And um, cool. Yeah, so we're gonna get out of here though. Until next time, I'm Dave, and I'm Matt, and I'm Joel. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Later, yo. Stand by, y'all. Stand by. A lot of things in the chat. I was trying to read the chat. It's really hot. Yeah. I think we covered it. Yeah, we did.